ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಜಾತವೇದ ಸೇಸು ನಮಸೋ ಮಮರಾತಿ ಯಥೋ ನಿಧಾತಿ ವೇದ ಸ ನ ಪರಿಷದತಿ ದುರ್ಗಾ ವಿಶ್ವಾವೇವ ಸಿಂಧು ದುರಿತಾತ್ಯಗ್ನಿ ತಗ್ನಿವರ್ಣ ತಪಸ ಜ್ವಲಂತಿ ವೈರೋಜನಿ ಕರ್ಮ ಫಲೇಶು ಜುಷ್ಟ ದುರ್ಗಾ ದೇವೀ ಗುಂ ಶರಣಮಹಂ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೆ ಸುತರಸಿತರ ಸೇ ನಮಃ ಅಗ್ನೇ ತ್ವಂ ಪಾರಯಾನವ್ಯೋ ಅಸ್ಮಾನ್ ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ಬಿರತಿ ದುರ್ಗಾ ವಿಶ್ವ ಪೂಶ್ಚ ಪೃಥ್ವೀ ಬಹುಲಾನ ಉರ್ವಿ ಭವಾತೋಕಾಯತನಯ ಯಶಯ್ಯೋ ವಿಶ್ವಾನಿ ನೋ ದುರ್ಗ ಜಾತ ವೇದ ಸಿಂಧು ನುರಿತಾಧಿ ಪರ್ಷಿ ಅಗ್ನೆ ಅಕ್ರಿಮನ್ಮನಸಾಗ್ಮಾಕಂ ಬೋಧ್ಯ ವಿತಾತನೂನಾಜಿತ ಗುಂಸ ಮಾನ ಮುಗ್ರಮಗ್ನಿಗುಂಭುವೇವ ಪರಮಾತ್ಸದಸ್ತ ಸ ನ ಪರ್ಷದತಿ ದುರ್ಗಾ ವಿಶ್ವ ಶಾಮೇವು ಅತಿ ದುರಿತಾತ್ಯಗ್ನಿ ಪ್ರತ್ನೋಷಿ ಡಮೀಡ್ಯೋ ಅಧ್ವರೇಶು ಸನಾಚೂತಾನವ್ಯತ್ಸ ಸಚ್ಚಿ ಸ್ವಾಂಚಾಗ್ನೇತನು ವಿಪ್ರಯ ಸ್ವ ಸ್ಮಭ್ಯಂಚ ಸೌ ಭಗವಾಯ ಜಸ್ವ ಗೋಭೇಜುಷ್ಟ ಮೈಜೋ ನಿಷಿಕ್ತ ತವೇಂದ್ರ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಕಣು ಸಂಚರೇ ಮಾಂ ನಾಕಸ್ನ ಪೃಷ್ಠಮವಿ ಸಂವಸಾನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವೀ ಲೋಕೈಹಮಾನಯಂತ ಕೋತ್ಯಾಯನಾಯ ವಿಮಹೆ ಕನ್ಯಕುಮಾರಿ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ದುರ್ಗಿ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಸಾಯಿರಾಮ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸಿಂಗ್ ಮೈ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಹಂಬಲ್ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ್ಸ್ ಎಟ್ ಭಗವಾನ್ಸ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಲೋಟಸ್ ಫೀಟ್ ವಿ ನಾವ್ ಕಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ದ ಡೇ ಟೂ ಆಫ್ ಐ ಕ್ಯೂಬ್ ವರ್ಕ್ಶಾಪ್ ಬೈ ಇನ್ವೋಕಿಂಗ್ ಭಗವಾನ್ಸ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಬ್ಲೆಸ್ಸಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಸಾಯಿರಾಮ್ ಎ ವೆರಿ ಮನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟುಡೇ ಐ ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಟು ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಟು ಯು ಎ ವೆರಿ ಡಿಗ್ನಿಫೈಡ್ ಎಂಟರ್ಪ್ರೆನ್ಯೂರ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಬಿ ರಮೇಶ್ ಶ್ರೀ ರಮೇಶ್ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟೆಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಬ್ಯಾಚುಲರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಾಮರ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫರ್ದರ್ ಡ್ವೆಲ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಎಜುಕೇಷನ್ ಬೈ ಪರ್ಸೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಬಿಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಅಡ್ಮಿನಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಎ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಲೀಡರ್ ಸರ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಲೆಡ್ ಟೀಮ್ಸ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟೀಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡೆವಲಪ್ ಆ್ಯನ್ ಇನ್ ಬಿಲ್ಡ್ ಕ್ವಾಲಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಫಾಸ್ಟರಿಂಗ್ ಟೀಮ್ ಸಿನರ್ಜಿ ಬೈ ಅಪ್ಹೋಲ್ಡಿಂಗ್ ಇಂಟಿಗ್ರಿಟಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಥಿಕ್ಸ್ ಶ್ರೀ ರಮೇಶ್ ಇಸ್ ಕರೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ದ ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜಿಂಗ್ ಡೈರೆಕ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ರಾಮ್ಸ್ ಫಿಟಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಕ್ಸೆಸರೀಸ್ ಪ್ರೈವೇಟ್ ಲಿಮಿಟೆಡ್ ಚೆನ್ನೈ ಅಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಷನಲ್ ಕೆರಿಯರ್ ಶ್ರೀ ರಮೇಶ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಅಸೋಸಿಯೇಟೆಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಸಾರ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಲಾಂಗ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಸರ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ದ ಮೆಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಸತ್ಯಸಾಯಿ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ ನೈಂಟಿ ಫೋರ್ ಸರ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಸತ್ಯಸಾಯಿ ಬುಕ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟೀನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಸತ್ಯಸಾಯಿ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ತಮಿಳ್ನಾಡು ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಸೆಪ್ಟೆಂಬರ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಏಯ್ಟೀನ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಬ ರಮೇಶ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಕರೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ದ ಕನ್ವೇರ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಸತ್ಯಸಾಯಿ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ತಮಿಳ್ನಾಡು ಬಿಗ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸೆಪ್ಟೆಂಬರ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀನ್ having such a noble person who has values indulged in every part of life is such a privilege for all of us with no further ado i'd like to welcome sri b e ramesh on to the stage thank you sai ram Sairam to you all. No, it's just uh, my dear Swami and my dear brothers. For me, it's a wonderful feeling because I also feel like a student with you. The, this morning, you know, there's an interesting uh, 
incident which happened, I think, in the where the food was served. I think people were eating in paper plates, and they handed over to me a stainless steel plate. I said, "Why should they give me a stainless steel plate?" And everybody is having a paper plate. They said, "You know, there's shortage of water. The last three days they've been doing." I said, "Give me a paper plate for me also." They said, "No, sir. You have a stainless steel plate." But I said, "I want to be part of the initiative." What of all of you have taken? I said, "I love to eat in the paper plate. <clears throat> It's a choice. None of you have done wrong by offering me a stainless steel plate, and I politely rejected it and ate with you, all of you, in the paper plate." as a free choice leadership is a choice it's a lifestyle if you see there are thousands and thousands of books on leadership <laughs> at least for the last 20 30 years we've been talking about leadership and if you see we have with us bhagwan shri satya sai baba who is the universal leader despite the fact that we have thousands of books there is a dearth of leadership why is it you know something about leadership right can you just tell what way you know about leadership no, no. see there is nothing like a right answer what you need to say is what is real for you what is spontaneous for you uh, so you don't have to look for the right answer but just tell me can you anyone tell me what's uh, what do you think of leadership what is leadership understanding situation leading the people leading the people fantastic good anything else uh, responsibility taking responsibility great anything we have 170 people right pardon time management pardon motivating coworkers fantastic i like the word coworker welcome to that yeah okay yeah fantastic getting the best out of people thinking out of the box okay a leader thinks out of the box right okay okay now uh, we uh, this is something which is uh, vital the uh, before we go to the foundations of leadership i want to ask you you all went for suprabhatam right why do you get up in the morning why do you get up in the morning such a simple question huh because you have to go to suprabhatam right i what about this or you have to brush your teeth but very rarely we ask a question why we wake up what to start the day yeah you can say that i'm alive therefore i've got up <laughs> so that's a, that's also right answer not, nothing wrong about that see okay and at home i don't wake up at all <laughs> right here there's somebody to wake you up if you don't wake up your team leader will wake you up right right no next the warden will come <laughs> okay why do you study to get good marks fair enough you want to become a topper in class and then there's a competition the topper invariably checks the marks of the next person who's gone hey how much marks did you get <laughs> okay why do you go to work you know, most people go to work right 
You want a living? Fair enough. Absolutely. In fact, uh, I was interacting with a team of core members, managers in our office. So one day I started the interaction, why do you come to work? And then one person said, for the growth of the company. Uh, somebody else said something. I said, no, let's. Then one person gave a honest reply, we come for our survival. Very honest answer. I said, we have 160 people working in the company. If everybody comes for survival, their own survival, where does it lead to? Okay. Why we have leaders? Many of you want to be an entrepreneur, right? Because somebody is an entrepreneur, so you want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> what it is. So these are questions uh, which are worth asking in life. So the power lies in the questions we ask and living in these questions and not looking out for answers. But the moment you are stuck with the answer, you can't grow. So if you have not asked a question so far, start asking from tomorrow why you wake up. Because I have just got one and a half hours time today. <laughs> So we, I can't, you know, take too much of our time on this. Okay. So I'll come to a story which Swami said in uh, way back, many decades back, I think uh, in the second Seva Dal conference about Paginini. Paginini is a violinist. He's an Italian uh, violinist, very famous, very virtuous person. So Paginini was once invited to France, Paris, for a world conference and he was to play the violin solo. So to cut the uh, uh, story short, when uh, Pagini was playing, the, there are four strings to a violin, right? So the one string broke. And then he started to play, the second string broke. And you see, they're all leaders. Uh, the best music critics of that time, they started to giggle, you know. Hey, second string is gone, so. And then the impossible thing happened when the third string broke. Then Swami went, uh, Paginini went to the stage, he said, Paginini and one string, and he played the best ever music in the history. Swami says, how is it possible? What is it that made that possible? He said, Swami says it's a Atma Vishwas or Atma Shakti. And then Swami goes on to give another story. You must have heard about uh, Lakshmi Mittal, the steel giant. His father was Mohan Mittal. And uh, Mr. Mohan Mittal wanted to have the Asia's best steel plant. So the government of Indonesia gave some benefits to him. So they, he started a Jakarta, they, they, he started a plant there. So having started the industry, he wanted to have a leader, you know, he wanted to set up a person who could manage the show. So he has recruited people from all over Asia. So he went to the place and he started meeting each and many people are working, very bright people are working. So he met the boy, what are you doing? Youngster, they said, I am, you know, uh, raising bricks. Another lady said, can't you see I'm working in the hot sun? So he met many people. And finally he met a spark who was cutting wood actually. So he asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm engaged in the task of constructing the Asia's best plant. Was the answer given by a person who was cutting the wood? Now, before you come to this, in, in the first time, in the first, uh, you know, the, 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 the three strings which broke when Pagrini was playing, Swami says the first string is your family. You know, your wife let down, your parents let down, all that. The second string, what Swami says, is your friends. And the third string is your co-workers. 
So finally says the one thing which was there is the Atma Shakti. When a person of this caliber, he has a larger purpose in life, when you ask him why you wake up in the morning, his answer will be totally different. Because he has something else. So, I'll give you another example of a person who was a trustee in Satya Sai Trust Tamil Nadu. Okay. Very senior person, he passed away. Swami has blessed him. Uh, the entire family, he, his wife, his children, they've all been very blessed. So after he became a trustee, I went to source, I said, what is the role of a trustee? A very simple question, right? Like the way I asked you, what is his answer? Can, you, can anyone guess? He said, Ramesh, you just have to attend tr three trust meetings a year. You have to attend three trust meetings. I said, I got a shock of my life. It's like saying, why do you come to college to at mark attendance? Right? Why do you attend BMBA? To mark attendance. So how is it possible that a person who is a trustee says that the role of a trustee is just to attend the three trust meetings? It's not the right answer, but I never argued with him. Uh, but I, I heard him fully, I understood him fully, but I knew the way forward. I'll give you another example of this. I'm, uh, I have a friend in, uh, in Sundram, you know, Sevadal, very bright boy, and uh, what I like about him is very, he's um, very casual, always smiling, uh, nothing um, sophisticated with him, and uh, very respectful person, and uh, he was a Balvika student, and uh, he was struggling to come up in life, he was earning about 5,000 rupees a month carrying sacks. So somebody, one of my colleagues said, sir, why don't we take him in our company? But by then he got some other job, he joined a company. So what, last year, I, uh, about eight months back, I met him in Sundram. I said, what are you doing? Uh, sir, the company has sent me, to, sent me to Australia for 12 days. I said, fantastic. Uh, you know, on a vacation. See, the person who joined the company has come up in life. Few weeks earlier, I met him in Sundaram. I said, uh, what are you doing in that company? He said, I'm in the accounts department. Then I said, are you a chartered accountant? Are you a chartered accountant? He said, no, sir. I'm a BCom graduate. Then he, then he answered something which I wanted to be, I wanted to understand very carefully. That is, that doesn't matter, sir. What he said in Tamil is something equivalent to what I'm going to tell you now. He said, I have to step into the shoes of my managing director and do the work I've got to do. So, I have to see the work, what I do from the, from the position of the CEO of the company. I said, remarkable boss, but I said, can you do one more thing? You're all, you know, students of Swami. Can you do the job imagining how Swami would have done? That's, that's the way we should think. And I'm telling you, he'll be several notches down the CEO of the company, guaranteed. I don't know if he ever uh, gets to meet the chairman, director, uh, MD of the company, but this is the reply he gave. I'll give you another example. You know this, uh, the silver tumbler, right? With water. I saw a boy in Sundram carrying water for Swami. That silver tumbler was sort of oxidized and you know dark black in color. I said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to keep water for Swami. Let's bring the glass. Do you have vibhuti? I said, why is it so oxidized? He said, no sir, once in three months we give it for polishing, they'll do it. Do you have Vibhuti packet or not? Took him with me, went to the, uh, the, the bathroom, washed with Vibhuti, applying Vibhuti on it. It became so bright. 
Very simple, right? He was doing the job of bringing water for Swami, but he was not bothered about the container, right? You ask me to bring water, I'll bring water. So it's very important that I'm giving all these examples to illustrate why we must have a larger picture in front of us. Okay, I'll come to this. Which means in life, being committed to something bigger than oneself is very, very crucial. Being committed to something bigger than oneself is being committed in a way that shapes one's being and actions so that your ways of being and acting are in the service of realizing something beyond your personal concerns or for yourself, beyond your personal payoff. What the boy told in that steel plant was that I'm engaged in the task of Asia's best steel plant. He was not concerned about the salary what he's going to get. He was not talking about survival. The other boy whom I met, he said, I should do the work placing myself in the position of the managing director of the company. And the person who was earning 5,000 rupees, what is he now? Much, you know, the way he has progressed, because that's why he was acknowledged and he was sent to Australia on a vacation. Once you handle that, the results will follow. Okay. Committed to something bigger. As they are acted on, such actions create something to which others can also be committed and have the sense that their lives are given being an action by something bigger than themselves. This is an important aspect of great responsible life, great personal life, great leadership and a great organization. So, when times, there are times when things go, uh, uh, times when nothing goes right, there's no way, nothing there except you can do to find something within yourself, the strength to preserve in the face of impossible, insurmountable hurdles and barriers. Every great personal life includes having to come with grips with the profound challenges. When you are committed to something bigger than yourself and you reach down inside, you will find the strength to continue. This is what I was trying to tell you. So what you can do is, you can sort of try to find for yourself, and I spoke to you in the first question was, something like this. You can find for yourself why, like, you know, to help people find their purpose so that they find true meaning and work to push yourself to the best I can be so that I'm there for the society, to consistently grow, develop and challenge myself so that I can be the better person than I was the day before. So some more examples. Let's say you wake up in the morning that, boss, I want to make a difference in the quality of lives of people around me. What do you wake up at that time? You jump out of the bed, right? To empower people whom I interact with so that they shift from where they are to where they could be. So that they can realize their potential. Not limiting themselves to what they think they could achieve, but go beyond the self-imposed limitations. So this is something which I like about. We had a, in a company, we had a person who was a fitter, you know, the, the, you know carpenters? We have about 160 people working. This boy was working for a carpenter as a fitter. So he was getting something like 3,000 rupees. At that time, he started with the, I started with the salary of about 5,000 rupees. Later on, he became an assistant manager. He was drawing something like 70,000 rupees. <clears throat> and all the customers used to throng to him. He never spoke English. But all the architects and interior designers used to say, where is Murugan? You know, they used to come and ask for him. Now he's, he started his own business also. So, usually, you know, I, whenever I meet people in my company, I, I interact with them so that, so that they know what they could be, how they can progress further. Uh, there's another person by name, uh, who, another person who was a driver in a company. 
who became a senior technician. So he could have been a, been a driver for the rest of his life. He was drawing 7,000 rupees, now he's drawing about 60,000 rupees as a senior technician. He is handling about 12 technicians. That's the power of language. That's the power which lies within each and of us to see where I can go in life, where the other, where others work with, who work with us can progress. Uh, we have so many cases, I don't want to get into too many details, but I'm just giving you a glimpse of that. Let's see the role, what, let's see what Swami has said about this mission, right? To have a task, I have a task to foster all mankind and ensure for all of them lives full of bliss. He made a declaration, right? Yes. And he lived it. I have a vow to lead all who stray away from the straight path again to gain again into goodness and save them. To remove the suffering of the poor and grant them what they lack. Okay. So, what am I trying to say? Swami took the physical form, human form, and declared. And he said, I am God, you are also God. But we refuse to believe. No, Swami, you be in the pedestal. I will be Ramesh. Swami says, I am a leader, you are also a leader. Next point is authenticity. These are all foundations of leadership. Okay. Being and acting consistent with who you hold yourself out to be for others and who hold yourself to be for yourself. Okay. When leading, being authentic leaves you grounded and able to be straight without using force. Any attempt to be authentic on top of our inauthenticities is like putting cake on a cow dung. See, there's a cow dung at the bottom and then you put the cake on top. The cow dung will be there. One cannot pretend to be authentic. That is being inauthentic. Being authentic is, okay, I'll, I'll give you some examples for you to understand. We as persons in our organization desperately want to be admired, right? We want to be admired. Facebook, Twitter. We live in a culture where we want to be admired for what we are not also. For many, admiration is most valuable. We live in a culture, as I said. Almost none of us is willing to confront how much we want to be admired and how much readily we will avoid losing being straightforward and completely honest in situations where we perceive doing so threatens the loss of admiration. But you don't want to lose. You want people to admire you. So what do we do? We fake goodness. We fake humility. We will do almost anything to avoid the loss of admiration, stretch the truth, hide what might be embarrassing or unpleasant or even awkward when required and tell an outright lie. We also want to be seen by our colleagues as being loyal, protesting that loyal is a virtue, even in situations where the truth is that we are acting loyal solely to avoid loss of admiration. And in such situations, how ready are we to sacrifice authenticity to maintain the pretense of being loyal when the truth is that we are being loyal only because we fear losing the admiration of our close colleagues, subordinates and bosses. So we are not straight. Yeah. So if we cannot find the courage to be authentic about our inauthenticities, you can forget about being a leader or having a great personal life. And an organization that cannot be authentic about its own inauthenticities will experience great difficulties, uh, conflicts, costs, and inevitably, inevitably, inevitably loss of reputation. So I'll tell you an example in my life. 
Any questions so far? Any questions? So, I was a part of an NGO, but not, I don't know, social club organization, Lions Club, for many years, for some, at least about a decade, I think 85 I joined. And what happened was, every year the, the, your position changes. So I was a charter secretary, then I became a president, then I became a district chairman and all that, then I became a zone chairman. And if I had been there for a few more years, I would have become a district governor. So, you know, the, the name, fame, position, and all these things, they can drive you crazy. It will eat you. So it really sucks your life. It takes the life out of you. So when I realized that I was not authentic, I could come out of it. And then I came to a statistic organization. So we do, we have a lot of welfare measures in our company. <clears throat> but if I had to do, for, to get the admiration of their workers, it's no use. I have to check whether they need, what they need. I provide, because that's very artificial. So as I said, some of us uh, are, you know, we uh, humble, appear humble, appear truthful, appear honest. You know, I, uh, in such organization, the other day I met a person, bhajan singer. How many of you are bhajan singers? Okay. <clears throat> so, there's a conversation going on between two people. Hey, you sang the Ganesha song so well, he said. Oh, mommy's grace. So, I, I just, you know, okay, fine. Ten minutes later, he, he was engaged in a conversation with somebody else, the same boy said, Hey, I sang the Ganesha song. Did you hear that? I sang. Then later he said, You know the seventh song, you know who composed it? I composed. First, what did he say? Swami's face. So it's there everywhere. See, first of all, we should understand that we are all human beings. And we have to be in a state of awareness to, you know, see our own inauthenticities in life. And uh, when you go to work, you know, you can see some people uh, working very late in the evening. They do nothing in the day. And after 6 o'clock, they start working. You got a headache, sir? You got a headache? So some of them, you know, they, they don't come to office, they come to office throughout the day, they don't do, don't, don't do much work. And late in the evening, they'll start. After office, they oh, you have to prove, no, that you're a hard worker. Or some people come early in the morning to prove that you're a great worker. Right? <laughs> oh, let's see how many of you do when you go to office. But I know you'll not do that, but I'm just giving you an example. Or some of you will come on a Sunday. Next is being a cause in the matter. This is a very, very interesting thing. I want you to listen very carefully. See, I'm not telling you any tips. Being honest, being courageous, being, I mean, I'm just going something with far more fundamental. So, you're able to focus what I'm saying? Absolutely, okay. Being a cause in the matter is a stand you take on yourself and your life. A stand is a declaration, declaration you make, not a statement of fact. Being a cause in the matter is viewing life from and acting from that stand that I am the cause in the matter for everything in my life. Being willing to view life from this perspective leaves you with power. You are never yourself a victim. I'll give you some examples for you to understand, but let me go through this. It is not true that you are cause for everything. You can't say, you know, sir, why are you blaming me? Something happening there? How am I concerned? That you are a cause for everything in your life is a, pla is a place to stand from which you view and deal with life. A place 
exists solely as a matter of choice. You can, which means that you can count on me and I can count on you. When you do this, you give a right to blame the circumstances. You can't say, because you are the cause in the matter. When I, when I, when I share the examples, you understand what I'm trying to say. You can't say I'm a victim because you're, you're cause in the matter. It doesn't prevent you from holding somebody else responsible. There's no blame, there's no guilt, there's no praise in this. It leaves you with power. So I'll tell you an example. There's a boy who was working in a company. He was an alcoholic. Every Monday, he used to take leave. I said, there's something missing. Some, every Sunday is taking leave. So I said, let me check. And I kept knowing that he's drinking because Sundays he has a drink and then Monday he doesn't come to office. And uh, I met his mother <clears throat> and I told her, why don't you get him admitted in the D alcoholic center? And I had to go to his house, which was in a building. In, I had to walk across the slums. Okay? Go to the slums and go to the LIG building. It's in a pathetic shape, the house. But I went there. See, I could have sent him off, right? Why should I have him? Why should I go there? Because he belongs to me. I don't think I would have gone to anybody else's house so many times in my life. And uh, you know the answer which his mother gave was, if I admit him in a de alcoholic center, what will my relatives think of him and me and my family? For her, the reputation of the family is much bigger than the life of a son. Can you understand? And finally, he passed away. The boy passed away. He's an extremely good worker. Very talented. So the mission, I failed. I don't have an issue. I did my job. I felt I'm a cause in the matter. I did what I could. There's another example. A person who's working in my company now is a, a, a middle-aged person. <clears throat> it took three years for me to make him give up drinking. Three years. To one after three years, I used to be in touch with him. I used to send him out. Now he has given up smoking and drinking. What do we normally do? Why do we have? Why should we have such people? Send them off. Correct. Why would not have done that? No. And will you do it, or will your father do it, or parent do it? If one of his son is Addicted. Will he throw him out of the house? Yes or no? No. Why should I then? And the same thing happens, you know, some people, uh, some people are sick at the office. They don't turn up. They don't come to office. So one interesting thing happened that uh, one of our managers said, sir, he was... Uh, he took, he said one week leave, he has taken one week leave, now it's about two weeks he has not come. There's no information from him. I said, did you call him? No sir, there's no information from him. The same question, I said, did you call him? Okay. What's your name? Huh? Priyanshu, your name? Shukumar. You came and told me, Shukumar has not reported for duty. Okay? One week. No, it's two weeks, sir. I asked him, did you call him? And you gave a reply, sir, he has not called me. Then I said, did you go and meet him? Me? Why should I go to his house? No. Why should I? So the whole thing is, when, when somebody is not well, 
The next thing is, he's not reported. Did you care to call him and find out what's happened to his life? How is he in, what is the issue with him? Did we, do we call them? Yeah, we have so much concern with the rules and regulations and all that, attendance and stuff like that, but we don't care for people. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, the manager was walking past in our company and I saw one of the executives wishing the manager, good morning, sir. The manager said, can you imagine? Said, Boss, he's wishing you good morning. Why didn't you smile? So, what you should do is, if that brother, we say, you know, brother, Sai brothers, you know, I'm, Sickening, you know, you, you don't mean it. And don't call brothers. But at least be aware that I'm calling you as a brother, but I don't mean it. That's being inauthentic about your own, authentic behavior, about your own inauthenticity. So what I'm talking is about a huge step, a radical step, unconventional, unreasonable step. You're just acknowledging that I was there when my staff was drunk, I was there for him. You're just declaring, making a declaration, right? If it's comfort you want, leadership is not the place to be. Forget about being a leader. Forget it. It means sacrifice. Next is integrity. Being whole and complete, achieved by honoring one's word, creates workability, develops trust. Okay, till then you have any questions? Till I've asked, I've given the examples. Any other questions you have? You're going to, this is a, this, with this we'll stop with this uh, foundation of uh, leadership. Yeah. Sir, it's about, uh, sir, how do we exhibit like admiration without letting, without uh, making the other party know that it's inauthenticity. I didn't get you. Sir, if we are showing admiration to, say, our subordinates. Yeah, that is appreciation. Sorry. That's, no, I didn't talk about that. Please, I, I'll tell you that. What I was talking about is, if somebody has done a good job, go and appreciate him. I am talking about the admiration you have for yourself. You are wanting to project in the community, in the society, through your posts and, your, and all that, what you are not. You understand the difference? Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, in today's modern world, we see the notion of fake it till you make it being popularized <laughs> a lot. So, so let's say if my, if I receive feedback that I'm not humble enough, then how do I actually incorporate into my life like, without being inauthentic? Yeah, first thing is for, you have to understand that you're not humble. So, I have to take the whole day session. First thing about life is that, please sit down. So how do you realize that you're not humble, right? You know it, right? I received that from someone else. Absolutely, it doesn't belong to me. Or you say, isn't it? Or it doesn't belong to me. And and probably he knows that you're not humble. And he is lying, maybe. So don't take people seriously. <laughs> Honoring your word means keeping your, keeping your word. Do what you said and would do it by the time you said you do it. Or as soon as you know that you will not do it, go back and tell them, boss, I said I will do it. I am not able to do. I will not keep the timeline. I will do it in some other day. That's what I mean by that. So that way you get the trust of others. So in workspace when integrity declines, workability declines and value declines. So integrity for a person is a matter of a person's word. Nothing less, nothing more. We always say, no, action speaks louder than words. So, you come to, I'll give you an example. 
you show up late to office right you report office late what do you do the boss says you have come late what do you do huh search for reason search for the exactly exactly shukumar you nailed it <laughs> so keeping a word <clears throat> so i'll come to that i'll go to the next thing i think we'll skip few so whenever you will not be keeping your word i told you then you not okay fine that's fine okay this is what i said in life we either produce results or reasons for not producing results and you will justify you will swear really sir so this is very tough to get in life but i can tell you either we produce results or valid reasons to justify you give enough excuses for not producing results or coming late so the way we speak is no result plus an excuse equals result right but what's the truth no result is no result so when you say no result what do you do you start working to ensure that you produce results so this is very important that you keep your word so what is leadership leadership is not rank or position how many of you thought leadership is rank or position good anybody else be frank leadership is a choice a lifestyle you know some people uh, they go to office there i am a leader but you know or in the lines in the, the satisha organization i am a leader but i am not a leader in my office if you choose to take care i'll give you a simple definition okay what's your name sumuk and your name shiv shankar sukumar shiv shankar your name Irayan. Irayan. Sumuk, if you take care of the person on your right, and if you take care of the person on your left, you are a leader. So simple can it be? Don't understand? If you can take care of the person on your left and your right, you are a leader. So what do you do when you go home? What do you do when you go home? Your parents are there. Take care of your parents. when you go to work you have somebody on the left and right which means you care for another person i'm bringing you know so that you can understand what i'm trying to say it's just about a question of caring for people and imagine uh, mr prasad will know swami when some student is not well swami has physically gone to the hostel right physically gone to see the student who the lord of lords the avatar and you talk you say that he has not informed me what is the ownership you have and when everything goes right you give credit to your team not to you and what do we do and when he does a job he will go and project boss i have done it you won't give credit to him and when things go wrong like the isro the first flight i think uh, abdul kalam was the head of the leading the thing and then it it uh, fell into the bay of bengal so at the time satish dawan was the head of the isro he said the mission failed he said i will go and face the media and he said i failed but he went to, but the next time when it was successful he made abdul kalam go to meet the media and present that's the true quality of a leader a uh, leader is not a lead warrior it's not about being tough it's not about being smart it's not about being fast how fast 
how really good you are at helping people and that's the way to advance in the world and swami says help ever no now and when you have when you when you need help in your office what do you do we don't say you know was i have a trouble so you you because you think too big of yourself so you have to, when you when you ask for help you'll be amazed to see how many people are willing to come forward to help you in life so learn to help each other so but when you ask for help that will happen only when you take care of them first right and what swami says i marked in blue don't expect them to help you your job is to take care of them without expecting anything in return unconditional love and you know in, in meetings when you go to offices the boss has something to say hey this is a problem this is the thing this is the decision i have taken anything else you want to say that they more because we can't ask them to speak leaders speak last so they get views from different people so they get better ideas which can be implemented so they get the benefit of ideas from others leadership is a team sport no one is strong enough or smart enough to be to lead by themselves best leaders do not consider themselves as experts no matter how successful they are they consider themselves as student i am a student i am very clear about that the whole business of leadership is climbing on a mountain with no top there's no top better climb you just have to keep growing so best leaders constantly learn how to lead okay this is very very important so as you achieve fame and success in life right what happens fine but there's something there's a there's a you know the former us secretary under secretary for state was addressing a huge gathering about 2000 people were there and he was holding a styrofoam cup you know what is a styrofoam cup coffee there of it's a plastic cup he said last year i came to the same venue when i was a secretary for state for defense and i flew they flew me business class and somebody came to the airport to pick me up then drop me in the hotel come to my room i checked in next day morning somebody was waiting for me in the lounge to carry my luggage and they took me took me straight into this auditorium i was taken to the green room and i was offered a ceramic cup this time i flew economy class all by myself i had to book my ticket and nobody was there to receive me in the airport i took a taxi came to the hotel i checked in paid for it next day morning i took a taxi came to the venue and i said uh, <clears throat> i asked somebody can i have a cup of coffee he said they point see there there's a coffee there you can go and take it so he said that what we deserve in life is what what cup no ceramic cup is for the position you hold was last time he was a secretary for state defense he's a former secretary so when i am a trust convener people open the door they say sir and all that that's for the position you have a right to reject it you want to enjoy it not a problem but it's not for you it's for the position you hold and people don't get that so we should learn to be what is the what is the important quality of the learn 
humility right isn't it and you see so many people in the organization or very where you have seen in life they think you boss he thinks so much of about himself and you see in companies that you see was a so damn concerned about the bottom line themselves they don't care for the people okay this is a very important thing for you all of you you join a company right and you do your job extremely well they give you a pay like and uh, at some point of time you will get promoted right and uh, there will be 10 15 people reporting to you here is the thing there is a transition you got promoted for doing your job well right of that and you you do you go for advanced education get promoted you get promoted <clears throat> if you are good you get promoted what will you do what is it you are supposed to do do the same thing what will you do the job of a leader is not to be in charge but taking care of those who are in charge your job is to take care of the 10 people who are working with you so you become responsible for the people who do the job you used to do so which means you start to lead them guide them skill them give them the knowledge help them grow maybe it might involve sitting them sitting late at work no helping so <clears throat> the next important quality is this you feel safe with some people no and you see when you go to work you remember me some people make you very uncomfortable in life maybe some of your relatives so what do they do in the company they lie they fake <clears throat> hiding mistakes they don't admit when they make a mistakes because for the fear of being thrown out of the company so they disappear when things go wrong they will not be there at all <laughs> so you come to the office with the feeling that some of the decisions don't benefit the employees but only it, it helps only the promoters and the shareholders so you remain unfulfilled in life it work okay this uh, anybody who goes to the gym you go to the gym no huh you you do you don't go <coughs> so how many months you have been going to the gym two years two months and uh, anybody goes for jogging cycling if you go to the gym right you work out for 45 minutes come back stand in front of the mirror you will see nothing next day you go work out for another 45 minutes and come back Stand in front of the mirror. Mirror. What do you see? Nothing. <coughs> and then you do the third day, and then the fourth day, you say, "Boss, there is no use. You stop going to the gym. You go to you every each one. Everybody brushes teeth, right? Except Suprabhatam also. Before going to Suprabhatam, everybody brushes. Okay. What is brushing the teeth? Two minutes a day, two minutes in the morning, two minutes in the night. What does it do? Huh? Clean. 
I understand. But instead of doing that, if you go to a dentist and clean and come and next one year you don't brush your teeth, what will happen? Exactly. So people treat this leadership with a lot of intensity. Oh, I, you know, what do we do? We treat leadership with intensity. Get a bunch of speakers. Next one week training leadership. They give you a certificate. Boss, you're a leader. You got the certificate. And nothing happens. It's not the intensity which matters in life, it's the consistency. You go to the gym 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day for 200 days, 250 days, it makes a difference, yes? You get up in the morning, you get up in the morning, what time here? 5, 5.30. Huh? 5.15. When you go home, <coughs> Mr. Prasad is not here, now you can all see. <laughs> huh? Seven. Ten. See, <laughs> what time you get up? You get up here because you don't have a choice. You are doing for somebody else's sake. And it's a burden on you. And during November, December, you will cover yourself and some of you, instead of sleeping in the room, <laughs> you can sleep in here. So, so what, is the, what is the price you have to pay? That's why many people don't become leaders. Sacrifice self-interest and putting their cause ahead of themselves. Great leaders have the cause. They are not worried about their comforts. Strong leader versus weak leader. A weak leader tries to compensate by acting strong. A strong leader allows people to see that they are weak. When I have a problem, I go and tell them, boss, I have a problem. And everybody is there to back me. Asking for help when needed. Don't deny the people who love you the honor of being there to support you. What is the greatest contribution of a leader? Tell me. Can anyone tell me? What is the greatest contribution of a leader? Huh? Intellect. To create and make more leaders. So we should be surrounded by people who are much more able than us. Empower them. Exploring who else can be a leader. I'm always doing that in my life. I keep seeing people when I interact with such organization members. Not talking to them as to where they are now, but where they could be. Exploring if others work to their potential. Exploring how others can excel in their jobs. Okay, this is the most important thing. You have all this problem, right? How do you confront your friend here? You want to confront people, right? There's nothing wrong in confronting. You know, you have issues in life. How do we confront? How do you give it? Normally, what do you do in office? You take a piece of paper. Well, this is wrong. Fix it. We usually point out the evidence first, right? Or let's say we can have something like this. This is something I don't know what it means. I wanted to raise this with you in case there's an issue because I care for you and so that you can grow here. But there's evidence that things are not okay. I need to address them if there's anything wrong. Some issue you have. So give them space to listen. So invariably what we do is when, they, when we are, there's a confronting situation, we avoid or we shout. <gasps> the, both of my, the person who shouts, the other person leaves at home, in office. I observed that you are a bit harsh with your team members. At times, I have a bad day, boss. Yeah, I have a bad day too. 
instead of saying why are you screaming at people instead of why are you yelling at people you can say something like this <clears throat> but you are really beating up people i don't know you are aware of it give them a feedback something like this because this is something which is going to happen because you are going to interact with people you are going to have a lot of people around with you and and uh, uh, people come from different cultural values and beliefs and so <clears throat> we need to have uh, access to this the knowledge of how to confront and that person i'm sorry i was not aware of that he might say so stop yelling at people nobody works for you nobody wants to work for you don't talk like that or you can say that uh, you know at times you are nervous when you are uh, when you are confronting issue you are nervous you don't know you can say that time has come we have to have the uncomfortable conversation i'm nervous that i may bump fumble i'm at times trigger and may agitate and make things worse but i must have a conversation although i may not do it perfectly i may not do it perfectly but i would like to share but you have told them that i may make a mistake in the process so that's the responsibility of the leader you will have to necessarily confront people you can't avoid it and leaders have to go first <clears throat> leaders are the first to go to the unknown area difficult area danger area that's why most people don't become leaders you are the first to enter the danger zone the buck stops there you with you me active listening you know uh, how to make someone else feel heard understood seen empathy and honesty is very important feedback <clears throat> what you can do is uh, the three things which are important uh, when you when you have a conversation when there's a when you have to confront somebody how you feel and what is the behavior of that particular person that affected you don't say that you are always late to the meetings you need to come on time otherwise bad things will happen instead of saying that what you could say is when you showed late the meeting on so and so even though it is all the time i feel disconnected from you when you come work to late to work i feel disconnected if you continue to be late for meetings then i will come to a point where i will stop trusting you that's a better way of engaging the engaging the conversation so what i'm saying is confrontation is a human skill confrontation is not aggressive or mean or insulting when you are tense you address it when you have a disagreement which will invariably happen you have to address it you may fumble you can also apologize if this is if this causes more tension take responsibility for the consequences so people don't confront because they don't have the skills to confront in life and these are small little things you know which happens in office uh, like you know you wish you know, i was telling the other day of a person wishing a senior manager good morning and he, he just ignored but just talking to people uh, we provide lunch for all the workers you know the staff so i you know you find out how is the lunch and at times you feel some people are down you know they you know they see the face there's something wrong with them inquire them what happened boss not well somebody is everything is okay at home and one of the staff was saying that he wanted to commit suicide and i spent almost 2 3 hours with him so uh, you know there's some issue you know in his house and all that so people come with a lot of issues and so people don't come to office by you know they come with a lot of baggage right as leaders you have to handle that laughter sharing a joke and very interesting you know in the sales team when i talk to some of the people the sales team when i suddenly come hey boss you have any idea to improve the sales and they come out with brilliant ideas only thing is the managers go and talk don't talk to them you know the people who bring lot of ideas 
to work. But what happens is if you have a thousand five hundred people working in a company, okay, can you remember the names? Impossible. Beyond 150, it becomes very difficult. So what do, what do, what is it you've got to do when you know large corporates? You have to bring in a culture. I can care, I can take care of those whom I know with the sole purpose that they take care of the people whom they know. The next level. Any questions so far? Any questions? Nothing? Yeah. Ask. Being liberal or strict? Ask. What do you mean by being, being liberal? Casual. Hold it. Casual. Ask. No. What is the question? Ask. Ask. No problem. No. What is he? You ask in Hindi, no? Ask. You speak Hindi? No. I'll tell you what. You have to be firm when things go. You have to be polite. You have to be firm. Uh, something at times you have to be ruthless and you have to be compassionate it, 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 uh, both are required for the leaders you have to be tough at times I tell you I am a convener of Satya Sai Trust at times I have to disagree with other trustees right on issues or other people have been much, much senior to me how do I do it how do I do it? I have the cause in mind. What is the cause you have? You want to please people? No. My loyalty is to Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba, to the trust and the organization. If you are clear about it, you will have no issues at all. So when somebody makes a mistake, you don't confront the person, you confront the issue. I have nothing against you, boss. I'm only saying this is a mistake which you can, which has to be corrected. Any other question? Sir, uh, is there a compulsion to be good at something to be a leader? Because mostly I've seen like if you want to get promoted. Uh, you need to be good at something, then you can lead others. So, uh, what, is there a point like if you are average in in a particular thing, you can also lead someone? What I'm saying is, each one of you is a leader. Leader. You went through the entire thing presentation. Yes, sir. Like, Your question is how to be a leader. No, it's like uh, taking care of other, what does it mean? Like being, I can take care of my fellows, uh, like uh, uh, I can manage with them. I can? Manage with them. So not manage, not manage. When things go tough, are you there to help them? For them? You have the skills? You have the skills? At work, you have the skills. Yes, sir. Yes. Are you willing to share the skills with them? Are you willing to support them? Are you willing to make them grow like the way you have grown? Are you willing to come out of your comfort zone? You want some tips for leadership, right? It's not like that. Just I had a confusion in mind like uh, everywhere I've seen like uh, uh, the default qualification for being a leader is that you need to be good at a particular thing 
then you you can lead a uh, you, you can lead a you have to be a good human being think so simple first you have to be being and you have to see that everybody else is a human being people come with lot of emotions to office and and make sure that when they leave the office don't dump them with lot of uh, you know garbage in the office to make sure that so and you know when they come they come with a uh, each one there's a family behind them they come with lot of there's a uh, uh, difficulties which you they come across in life they come to office with all that so what i'm saying is that you know i said the four foundations of leadership we can discuss after the thing is also we can have a private chat about that any other question so here is something which i want to share okay i was in fifth standard okay this is me this is not artificial intelligence sir this is really be ramesh don't think that you know ai he has cooked up you know it's not a fake ramesh the original ramesh <laughs> so there's a sports day and uh, uh, i think we had this 150 meters race i participated and uh, you know what's a sack race you also participated huh? You know what's a three-legged race? And then then slow cycling, I think slow cycling. So that event happened a month back earlier. And then on the school day, uh, you know, when the the teacher said, uh, "Hey, Ramesh, you you're the uh, topper, is it? In, uh, I, I was supposed to receive an award. School first in fifth standard." and i received this cup and reached home okay i never expected this cup i never knew that i was winning, going to win this uh, cup but i went home and uh, my father was so happy my father because my father passed away in 82 i'm talking about 1968 and this, uh, i was born in 1957 the time was about um, 10 9 years old 10 years old I was so happy that I got a cup. He said, "Come." You know, he sent somebody to the studio, you know, the nearby photo studio, and got this photograph. If he had not done, I would not, I would not have got this. But that's not the point. Next day, he said, immediately said, "Ramesh, you got this rolling cup. You have to give it back to the school, right? Next year, they'll give you another small cup which you can keep. They must give. Why have not? They have not given." that's a question they asked my father asked i said i had no answer next day he came with me to the school at the time the school bus charge was 7 paisa can you imagine 7 naya paisa so both of us spent about 14 naya paisa to go to the school by bus my father was a gigantic personality you know very well i we walked we entered the school and we had to uh, go uh, walk through another school to enter the the school which i was studying so the school name is rosely matriculation school <clears throat> and he met the principal and he said you know my son got this cup and uh, you know you should be getting a small cup you know because we have to give it this back to the school oh she said oh you don't get it he came with a small cup and gave it to my father my was my father was so happy the joy which your father derives your mother derives when you do something life is something you know you can't imagine and uh, every time i think of it no it's so emotional that this is uh, a, a leader you know you talk about that person was there a leader who learns to appreciate his words for their success and will you be if you are a leader and uh, some of your team members going to achieve success will you be happy like that boss so happy you did it you know this is a uh, uh, this something which you all have to learn so which means the father is so caring brother when you mentioned about that taking care it's not easy 
I'll give you a small homework. Will you all do? It'll take two minutes or three minutes. You can do it now or you can do it later. Will all of you, all of you will do it? Very simple. Yes? All of you together. Yes, sir. Take a paper and pen. I don't want to send a message to your parents on WhatsApp or email. Write a letter to them, acknowledging them for what they have done in your life. I know some of you will not do it. Hey, boss, how to acknowledge, you know? Hey, my mother doesn't expect, so what? My father doesn't expect, so what? Write a letter as to what impact every mother and a father is a leader in your, leader in your life, right? Every parent is a leader, right? What do they do? They care for you, right? Supposing, you know, I was telling about a person who was sick in the office. He's not come to office. You're in a hometown and you do, you're supposed to come home from, come, uh, come from work at about 7 o'clock. You're supposed to come. If you don't come at 8 o'clock, what will your mother do? Hey, what happened? And if you go, don't come till 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock, they'll start calling your friends. What happened to you? Right? Next thing is what they'll do. They'll go to the police station. Hey, my son has not come. But do we do the same thing when somebody, some co-worker has not come to office, there's no information in his house, he's not come to office, will you do the same thing? Very unlikely. Why? Because he doesn't belong to me. Somebody is paying salary, I mean, I'm managing the company, I don't care. So it's your willingness to choose to be a leader that, that's important. So all of you will do the homework, definitely. So this is what I was trying to come. Every single employee is someone's son or daughter. Yes or no? Yeah? Yes? Yes? Okay, one more thing. Uh, see, I, I, lost my, I lost my mother about six months back. My father died in 1982. So some of you may have, I don't know, not sure, maybe a single parent. Or you can, you know, if nobody is there, you can send that letter to Swami to reach your parents anyway. Yes, some of you. So, like a parent, a leader of a company is responsible for the precious lives of people. You not manage. You're not, you're not talking about managing them. You're personally responsible for the lives of people in case you're going to be an entrepreneur. When you recruit someone, you're letting someone into the organization is like adopting a child. You join my office, right? Somebody, you join my office. I'm adopting you. Period. Can you live your life like that if you want to be a leader? All of you have gone to sleep, huh? Very tough, huh? This is not my cup of tea. You, you, you. So? This is too much, no? What I'm saying? Taking care of the lives of people. What do you say? Shoot questions. I can go on for leadership another... Uh, anyway, you're getting a book on uh, Mahavakya on leadership. Each one of you will get a book today. After the... Each one of you will get a book. Please study the book. 
Chibar has written, uh, and Swami's foreword, you know, it, it's all there. I want you to study the book. It's a wonderful book, which I, I, I it's just don't uh, read that casually. Don't read that book very casually. You have to study and get a lot of inputs about leadership. How many of you have read the book Mahavakya on leadership? No. Anybody? You have read? Good. How's the book? Tough, right? It's tough. So it's so it's not easy. You may go to sleep after studying. So, but you have to really see leadership is uh, okay. Coming back to the question, all of you have been asking. Despite the fact that for centuries we have been talking about leaders and leadership, how is it we don't have leaders? The scarcity, no? Why? I could have just finished my speech in one line saying that you follow the principles of Sri Satya Sai Baba, you will become a leader. That's not going to help you. We don't practice. Zero practice in our lives. And we are so keen of lecturing, advising, preaching, but we don't practice. The leadership is the learnable skill. It's practicable. It, everyone can be a leader. So there's a, uh, I heard this quotation from George Bernard Shaw. Very, very powerful. I heard this in 1985-86. I'm not a great fan of George Bernard Shaw, but anyway, I'll read that. This is the true joy in life. Being used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one. Being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances. Complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion that my, whole, my life belongs to the whole community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege to do it, do for it whatever I can. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It's a sort of a splendid torch which I have got hold of for the moment and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to the future generations. Lovely quote. So when you live a life like that, when you get up in the morning that you want to make a difference to the quality of lives of people, you'll jump out of the bed, boss. Ah, Suprabhadam, one day, one more day, Suprabhadam. When will the leave come? When will I go home? My mother will not wake me up. Eight o'clock, nine o'clock, Bindas. Till then, because you don't, you, oh my God. And what do you do when you go to work? You're looking for a Sunday. When will the next Sunday come? Right? Very keen. Oh my God, tomorrow's Monday. I have to go to work. And you say that you want to work for the growth of the company. No. When you look at your context, so we, we have to, so leadership is not a concept. It's not a concept to be understood. It is a place to come from. It is a place to you choose. There is a domain where you choose to come from and practice in life. Otherwise, it's become, you know, just one more day in your life. One more day, one more day. There's no joy. Is there, is there joy in your life? you start studying, you do that. So the whole thing is, you ask 
you have to start asking questions why why do you do what you do hey, how many of you are members of satish organization anybody is a member your parents are members of satish organization some of you so i'm through any other questions you have Uh, sir so as leaders we we will probably face a lot of conflicts later in life in our departments or within people whom we lead so how do we become mediators between conflicting parties or groups how do we mediate conflicts i told you confrontation we discussed that so, people come with different opinions right you must have if, in if a leader has to be absolutely neutral he should be impartial you don't play favorites your your boss and you have two people coming with issues right you will find out the person who is close to you and you'll support him right yes no sure yes. then you have no issue you know if you see you know you want to be admired by your colleagues why get into trouble boss you manage with yourself why do you bring it to me that's a very convenient way of avoiding you want to earn a good name no suresh and ramesh are fighting boss you sort out and one of them will leave the company right what does it matter for you you got a good name no any other question Yes, sir. One being admiration or the other being flattery. Flattery. When I mean admiration is flattery. So appreciation is something we have to do. Acknowledging people for their performance is something we have to do. But uh, what I'm talking about is flattery. And uh, you take credit for something which you have not done. Now your throat is okay, no? <laughs> leaders also being humans can also make uh, mistakes. Huh? So leaders can also make mistakes sometimes. Of course. Yes, sir. So with all that stake of yourself and others, how can we take that accountability? Who can take leaders? So the leader, like if he makes mistake, for the first have to tell them, I made a mistake, boss. the leaders have i mentioned there in the presentation leaders do make mistakes and you have to take responsibility for the consequences correct but don't fake don't say don't don't blame someone else leaders do make mistakes who said people don't make obviously people who work will make mistakes people who don't work will not make many mistakes mistakes sir my question is how we should remain calm uh, like when we expect something from our coworkers and we do, don't meet our expectation so how we should remain calm so first thing is that's why i said you know you have the boss you have any issue sir. so you have to talk to him there is a you want the, the performance issue right the performance is wrong so what you have to do is that what is preventing him from achieving what he wants is something you have to interact right has he got a issue at home we don't know is there some or you can ask him what is the support you need from me for you to accomplish the work you can ask yes or no is there something at work which prevents you from doing what you can do all this will come as a part of your questioning your interacting with them and 
you know, it re requires empathy. Do you have a concern for him? Do you really have a genuine concern for him? You have to say, boss, I am really concerned about you. I want you to grow in the company. Your performance has not been as expected. Is there an issue? Is there any way I can help you? Instead of saying, boss, this, 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 get lost. Want to ask some question? You're not, not a part of this team. Anyone ask a question? Yeah, yeah please. This never works due to this uh, preconceived notions. Preconceived notions of. Of are you talking about between the leader and the person or two other people? What are you talking it's about? It's a leader and the person. So, if does the, lead, if the leader knows the cause for which he is in the company, and if he's able to, please sit down. If he's able to interact with the person that, why is he in the company, if both are clear about that, things will get sorted out. Can you give me a specific example? No. Obviously, you have something in your mind, right? We used to judge based on our structure, like, huh? based on, they, they will stereotype persons, no sir. According to our group, they will stereotype persons. <laughs> so when we engage... Yeah, I didn't get your stereotype person. Uh, what is that? Stereotype persons. What does so, it mean? Like, uh, based on the group we are, they used to judge us. Yeah, yeah people judge. Fine, let them judge. But when we con confront them, they have that preconceived notion, this fellow is like that only, so... Let them have their own judgment, what's the issue about but, that? But uh, the confronting process never works, no sir, as you discussed here, it won't... Confronting, confronting, see, one group has a judgment about you, okay? What is the consequence of the judgment? You don't understand you. So what? Asking you. So what is the consequence? What does it matter if they, they judge you? What is their judgment of you? What is their judgment of you? You're bad? No. Whatever they are. That's okay. I'll tell you one thing. People are so busy with themselves, they can't think of others. Human beings are so selfish and self-centered. And judgments will be there. You already made a judgment when I stood here, no? You have some other judgment. If I have to be concerned about 170 people's judgment, how will I run my life? Your friends are going to judge, your friends are going to judge anyway. Who cares? Do be true to your conscience. And see if there's any mistake on your part, you correct it. If there's nothing, just leave it, ignore it. No questions. Either you have understood fully or you have understood nothing. So what do you do tomorrow? Huh? That you'll do today itself. Tomorrow you'll forget. See, one thing which I've learned in life is never, ever postpone. For me, there was no tomorrow in my life. I've erased it. Whatever I have to do, I'll do today. Whatever is possible. Of course, certain things you have to plan in life, but don't postpone. Can you tell me in this group who is the most effective leader? Some, 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 somebody can point out who is the leader in this group. Whom you think, whom you think is a leader? Anyone? Huh? Who, who? 
कम 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 ईश्वर किशन Why do you call him a leader? Huh? Vice captain. Position. Who's the captain? Who's the captain? Captain is not here today. Captain is not a leader. No. Captain is not a leader. Vice captain is a leader. Huh? Acha, tell me now. Let's appreciate him. No. But, but, but you are not. Why do you appreciate him? Smiling. Okay. What else? He cares for others. Genuinely, not faking. Next. How does he motivate? Tricks you, hits you, no? Huh? Motivating. Exactly. When you are down, boss, come. I'm here <laughs> to lift him. Tell me. Say something. See, I just want you to know that leadership is something within us. Each one of us. Well, I never. I, You know the thing is, I, I uh, my childhood, I've never spoken, but somewhere during the Lions Club, I started. I was a trainer. I used to train people. After leaving the Lions Club, I've stopped talking at all. Instead of training others, I have started training myself. Period. I stopped with that. Or tell me, some more. Give us some, this side. Any feedback you want to give about him? No, he is not your vice captain. Ah, what do you mean by friend? He knows what you are capable of, exactly, and what you don't know, he'll bring it out of you, right? That's a leader. Tend to be a leader, sir. Like I've seen many people who tend to be a leader, sir. Like they will, uh, when they have the responsibility, they will act good. As soon as they are out of the responsibility, they will behave in a very rude way or rude manner. But he's always the same, like position. Yes, sir. He's out of position. <laughs> What he said was not responsibility, position. Whether you're a vice captain or not, you will be a good human being, right? Yes. I learned something from me, boss. Today, you all learn. We are all students of leadership. What else? What? A, he gives credit to others. <laughs> Never takes credit. Whatever work he does, and he is the last to eat. No, <laughs> leaders eat last. Which which state are you from? Kerala. Oh, are you? So nice. Anything about him? See, is hold. Huh? Positive. Can you imagine? Just not one person. So many of you talking about him. So it says something. Can you tell me? Okay. He's not selfish, no. Huh? what i'm saying is that as you grow on the ladder you i still feel certain things which are not okay with me our job is to become aware of where we are and then correct ourselves it's a more self correcting process the more you are in touch with yourself you're grounded boss i think i have i was rude to shivkumar i shouldn't have done it or something in my life or you know that i i was rude to my sister Thank you so much.
Captain is not here today. Captain is here. MSC. So, anything else you want to say? In, uh, you know, I think the, I, the, the, we have the, we have Sri Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba, the universal leader. You, you and I cannot have a better leader in our lives. All the training I've had in my life is only through Swami. Please understand. And you're so fortunate that you're in the, this portals of this uh, Satisa Institute of Higher Learning. I wish you all the best. I want to become all of you to become the best leaders in the world. Okay? Jai Sai Ram. much sir this has been a very insightful session your personal experiences about leadership will surely help us in the future and we would also like to thank you sir for all the books you have been giving us and we all will use those books and study those books as you said thank you very much sir now i would like to request sri rlk prasad sir, as an assistant professor department of management commerce to present a memento to sri b ramesh
Om Sri Sai Ram, my humble pranams at the lotus feet of our beloved Bhagwan. A very good morning to one and all present here. It's my privilege to introduce Sri Prashant Raju. Sri Prashant Raju is an alumnus of Vidya Mandir, Mailapur, and then completed his B.Tech in Information Technology from SRM Engineering College. Sir was blessed by Bhagwan to study in our very own university, Sri Satya Sai Institute of Our Learning, from 2003 to 2005, from where Sir received his MBA. During the course of MBA, Sir received many opportunities to act in dramas in Bhagwan's presence and was blessed by Bhagwan himself. Upon completing his MBA in 2005, Sir joined his mother in her business and assumed the role of CEO of Trai Business Solutions Private Limited a Chennai-based business process outsourcing BPO firm that specializes in providing back-end support for retail banking and credit card operation. Inspired by Bhagwan's word to work for Village Upliftment, in 2006, Sir, along with his three co-founders, including his mother, started Sai Seva Business Private Limited, which was the first of its kind rural BPO firm in India in Puttapurgi. Sai Seva's mission is to provide sustained employment opportunities to educated youths so that they do not migrate to cities. The mission offers high quality of work delivered by a committed workforce at a lower cost, and most of the profits generated are offered back to the Sri Satya Sai Central Trust and affiliated trusts. Sir is currently the CEO of Trai Business and Director of Operations, Sai Seva Puttaparthi. He is also an trustee of Sri Satya Sai Trust, Tamil Nadu. Now I invite Sir Prashant Raju to the podium. Thank you, Saira. Om Shri Sai Ram. I offer my love at the lotus feet of our dearest Swami and pray that this offering pleases him. Respected teachers, co-delegates, guests, and of course my dear younger brothers, Sai Ram to all of you. Uh, I wish to first thank the director of the campus, Dr. Sai Manohar, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to be here. This is my second time here. The last time I was here was eight years ago. And I always feel that our Mudanahali campus is a very special campus because of such a, you know, a close knit that I can see visibly between the students and the teachers. It of course exists in the other campuses, but Mudanahali is always very special for me. The last time I had come, I still remember, the hostel building hadn't been built. And teachers, and some teachers and the students were living in the college campus itself. So amazing memories of uh, Mudanahali for me. I think the last time I was here, I had given a talk on um, it's a topic, duty uh, is devotion and work is worship. I enjoyed it, but I'm not sure about the students, but uh, I had a great uh, and very memorable time last time. So today, I have been asked to speak to you about uh, on the topic entrepreneurship. And uh, can I have my presentation on, please? Screen on. Thank you. Thank you. So the topic entrepreneurship, and I think most of us know what the word generally means, right? But uh, I looked it up on the dictionary to just see what it means. And it's, it says a person who sets up a business taking on financial risks in the hope of making a profit. By that definition, I must confess that I'm disqualified. Okay? So uh, the, though the profile he read out, the boy read out was, uh, said I'm you know, the CEO of this company and director of that and, and so on, uh, I have neither started anything, nor taken any risk, or done anything with the intent of making a profit. So I stand here, honestly, stand here today completely as a recipient of Swami's boundless grace. I can freely share with you that I have done little, if anything at all, to deserve what Swami has bestowed upon me. I mean, to make that very clear right up front. And um, my life, if I look back, has been a series of you know, incidents, like this happened to me and then this happened to me, rather than I did this and I did this. So 
I don't know why, but somehow he has found me fit enough to wear these caps, CEO, director, and now trustee. And uh, I just pray that I remain a fit instrument in his hands and do whatever tasks that he assigns to me. So I would therefore like to turn to someone else's inspiring real life story to do, to do justice to the topic of the day. And this is a movie-like story, okay? And I've had the privilege of seeing it uh, uh, you know, from a, what they say, ringside view of this. And uh, through this story, I think we will all together discover what the characteristics of an entrepreneur are. Like they start any movie, you should have a disclaimer, but this is a disclaimer with a difference. All characters are real, okay? And any similarity is purely intentional. So this is a real life story. Let's start opportunities. So picture this, it's the year 1985, and uh, Sujata, a young 24-year-old year lady, housewife, already with two children, is finding it very difficult to manage the household finances. Through a friend of hers, she heard about uh, CFTRI's classes on making jam and squash. Okay, CFTRI, you may know, is a Central Food Technology Research Institute. They con regularly, they conduct these classes. Uh, and so she borrowed 20 rupees from her husband, bought fruits, and went to the CFTRI class to learn to make jam and squash. She returned home with two huge bottles of jam. And as she was wondering what to do with two big bottles of jam, uh, a friend came by and offered to buy one of those bottles for 20 rupees. So she had earned her first profit right away. So she went back, uh, decided, and, 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 and invested that 20, 20 became 40, and uh, there was, soon there was a line of you know, customers waiting to buy it from her. All, see, those days we didn't have uh, these Tropicanas and Kisans. Kisan was a very small brand. So, and there was a big aversion to buying from big brands. Homemade was always better. So all these people who would otherwise not go to shops and buy started lining up to buy uh, fruits and sorry, jam from her. And uh, soon the demand went up so much that she couldn't keep up with the supply. And 20 became 40, 80, 160. And the whole house is smelling like a fruit go down. But though the children didn't mind, but it was a little too much. And uh, since she couldn't keep up with the demand and that she slowed that down and she decided to move on to something else. She realized uh, with the money that she had earned running the jam uh, and squash shop, she realized that see these uh, sari shops, right, like Nalli's and all that, she realized the margin that they have. See, think about 120 to 200 percent more than what a, reet, a wholesaler will be selling it at. So she went to a place called Go Down Street in Chennai. That's a place where a lot of wholesale merchants are. And she found one, um, <coughs> one such dealer who was directly importing saris from Surat and you know, wherever the saris were being made. So she spoke to him and he was very impressed with her. And for some reason he gave her very generous credit terms. So she would have one month to pay back, pay him back. And so she had very good eye for color and tasteful uh, you know, uh, you know, choices. And she would pick the best ones and bring them back home. Uh, a room in the terrace was converted into a sari shop, a sari, kind of sari um, display shop. And using her jam contacts, she started selling these saris. So again, people started, it spread through word of mouth and uh, you know, women started lining up, dozens of people coming to buy these saris. And she did something very innovative. And see, at that time, right, so that is when work, uh, women were entering the workforce. So they generally now it's very common, but at that time women were just entering the workforce and there was a great demand for such saris that are comfortable to wear, good looking and inexpensive. And because she knew what kind of margins they were, she was able to offer these at a great discount. So obviously even more popular. So this is innovation here. She did something very, uh, and completely, uh, what do you say, intuitive. She started uh, you know, giving saris. So, so if you were her first round of customers, you could take the best ones from her. And you could then sell it to your contacts. And the, it would be on a profit sharing basis. So they would take some saris from her, sell it to their you know, network of friends, and it would be a sharing basis. So this is ethical multi-level marketing, right? Without even, she was doing this without even knowing what she was doing. And uh, soon the sari shop, the sari business was booming. <coughs> and uh, this was the time she also learned what customer service is. It's a very, very important skill. You only learn that when you interact with people. 
And customer service means not just providing service, but understanding their needs. What do they like, their dislikes. Of course, providing service to them, responding to their complaints, and being customer focused on every decision that you make. So it's a huge uh, skill that she picked up at that time. She still had, so Jam was good, Jam had wound down, now, Sari was going very well, but it was not scalable because that's all the space we had. And she still had the urge to do something even bigger. So this is a very important takeaway. Um, you know, we are nobody if we don't have customers speaking for us. So the customer is the sole reason why we exist as entrepreneurs. And being customer focused is absolutely essential. And customers are our best assets, no matter what buildings or what you have, unless you have customers, you don't have a business. <clears throat> for the sake of uh, you know, brevity and because of time, I'll skip some of the other ventures she entered, but they were all very innovative and extremely creative, maybe some other time. But I'll move on to the next one, which was the most innovative one yet. So it was the year 1990. So she started this in 85, so five years of doing everything. Uh, 1990 was the year, era of liberalization. I'm sure some of you may have heard this term. Uh, what it means is, for the first time under uh, Sri P. V. Narasimha Rao, uh, what happened was private companies were now being allowed to do work that otherwise the government would only do. So Sujata's father had just retired from the postal department. And uh, he told her that the government is now allowing private parties to do uh, postal work, you know, mailing work. So again, it's a very alien concept to all of you, um, this generation. We had used to have lacks of postal mail, no email, right? No electronic mail, nothing. So uh, every day the postman will come with 10 letters for you, you know, that kind of thing. So every, all companies used to communicate only through postal letters. And um, <clears throat> since the government had opened up for the first time private companies to do uh, mailing, there was something called, um, yeah, the machine that you see on the left, it's called a franking machine. So a franking machine, you may have seen that red mark, that's called a frank. So that is equivalent of a stamp. So suppose a company has you know, lakhs of letters to, uh, to send to their customers, they can't just take it to the post office and dump it on them. The post office expects the mailers to all be franked, sorted according to PIN code, and only then handed over to them. So the idea that she had was called bulk mailing. So the concept is this. You will do the mailing on behalf of the company. So the company comes and gives you lakhs of pieces. You do all this pre-work and then take it to the post office and you get paid on a piece basis. And that's the oldest, that's the first brochure they made also. So the idea was good. It was clear. Bulk mailing was a possible concept. So the 20 rupees that she had invested in fruits and jams had now become 20,000 rupees. So she invested uh, in a franking machine and got a franking license from the government. I think she's the first woman entrepreneur to get this license. Okay, so sound business idea, it's a good requirement, machine is there, license has come, but where's the business? So, you know, she, she had no business contacts, she was a housewife, and you know, no other, and obviously the jam customers and sari customers are not going to give the poor lakhs of letters. So you know what she did? There's a road called Mount Road in, uh, in Chennai. It's, it's the hub of business. So every day she would leave in the morning, walk up and down Mount Road, looking at each company and imagining that they were her, you know, their customer. And she would barge in randomly to one co company, ask for the administration head and say, I want to meet so-and-so. I mean, no appointment, nothing of that sort. Wait for hours on end. And if she meets the right person, she would pitch this concept of bulk mailing. So uh, many people, and it wasn't a very, uh, it was a very normal concept, right? So not many people were even appreciative. They wouldn't, if they gave you the time, almost everybody said no. Some were encouraging, but nobody gave her the first break. <clears throat> Can you imagine how many companies she must have gone up and down to get the first break? Let's take some guesses. 10 companies, maybe 20, 50, 180. 180 companies she walked up and down, entered without you know, giving up until she landed her first break. And uh, so very innovatively, that, that old sari shop that I mentioned on the terrace now became an office. They hired retired post uh, sorters. So sorting, I told you, is you have to separate it according to pin code, which is a very specialized job. And you should see the speed at which they do it. You know, they'll, say, tuck, 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 they'll make it into lots. So she hired retired sorters, gave them re-employment, and started this bulk mailing business. 
it was a big success and after the first breakthrough life became a lot less you know harder more clients started coming and seeing the proof of concept working and uh, within two or three years she had four franking machines and uh, lakhs of mails were being processed by her company and probably more than any single post office in the city is being processed by just her company so if you see um, you know entrepreneurship courses today they will always tell you um, you know how to work it out in excel sheet even before you put the first rupee you'll be trying to see how to make the profit but that's not what it's really all about the, f- the first requisite that you need is self confidence self confidence in your concept and uh, and if, if in fact you know what is self confidence if it's just faith in god right so self in belief in yourself so that is the most important virtue that you need as an entrepreneur so the bulk business mailing business i told you prospered and uh, very soon you know the company was providing the service for multiple companies at the same time but this work is very seasonal seasonal in the sense towards the end of the year financial year you know it will just pour maybe towards festival seasons it will pour and it's very labor intensive obviously because you have to have huge workforce and uh, it wasn't very scalable at that point of time so one of the clients that she was doing work for is a company called citibank you know you must be knowing citibank is one of the largest banks and they had just entered india for uh, you know and they had launched credit cards in india they approached her and asked her for something very different so they said listen we are getting mails from customers you know you know you're sending mails out we are getting customer mails would you be interested in helping us process these mails what does that mean you have to get the customers letters you have to open them up read the letter of the customer understand the customer's issue provide a resolution do something for example you know you say i you know i've been charged for so and so you have to provide a fix for it and you have to respond back to the customer on behalf of the bank all this with the bank's supervision now just imagine put yourself in that place you know you have 30 uh, staff 20 of them are retired uh, sorters 10 of them are young boys you know just for doing manual work and you know this is the opportunity that comes to you so it's and to top it all off all this work has to be done using a computer a computer which she has never seen in her life you know it's unimaginable for all of us but 1990s computers were extremely expensive and not really common so very intimidating right to say if, if this was your uh, what came to you what would you do would you say i'll do it or will you say i can't do this this is too much this is beyond me so this is uh, where i think you know swami talks to us and uh, the swami in her gave her the, the intuition that we say told her take this opportunity knocks once grab it so she said yes i you know we'll do it and the company was formed called mmc infotech the name of the company is that and um, <clears throat> yeah so the first computer was hired we couldn't even afford to buy a computer so she hired somebody and asked somebody to teach her the business and uh, teach her how to use the computer and soon she was confident of handling this new process so this is actually not uh, you know the, the word bpo that you know business process outsourcing this is a co- term that was coined around the 2000s 1998 2000 so the activity that she was doing was business process outsourcing but the word itself had not been coined this is all 5 years before you know that had even happened and uh, mmc infotech the company was incorporated and the journey began all over again so this time the terrace was not enough the first uh, the, the drawing room of the house became the office a bedroom became part of the office ground floor became part of the office and business was growing so large i mean so fast that uh, they ran out of space and they had to find their own premises uh find their own premises because obviously it had to be a rental premises and the cost for equipping a you know a full floor with computers and with uh, you know the workstations and all the support infrastructure was 1 crore and she had to take a loan for this and the bank said we will give the loan but you just have to pay us back of course and uh, the ho- whole family was aghast 1 crore is a is a large number now but in 1995 it's 97 it is a unimaginable uh, really large number and said are you crazy how can you service one crore loan don't take it again you know without even knowing how many zeros are there in a crore but having full faith in swami she went for it and signed and um, with you know just the fire to achieve something right and she took the loan and 1998 the company moved out of the house into the new office 
located on the same Mount Road, which she was, you know, five years ago she was walking up and down. So they found a very nice office there, equipped it completely, and began doing this work in a very, very large scale. I think to start with they had 100 workstations and it could go up to 1,000. <coughs> So that's just some old photos that I dug up. Oh, that's the those old office that I told you. And um, the next part, so you see, you see computers, system, you know, uh, infrastructure, are all just enablers of business. They don't do the business for you. Who does the work? People. So the people are the most, if you need a company, to, a company has to grow, it should have the right people. So Jata's first employees were all graduates much like yourselves, you know, 22, 23 years old, fresh out of college, uh, from arts colleges, science colleges, full of energy, but they don't know anything. So, but she had this unique talent to identify those with potential. And she groomed those with leadership capabilities to taking more responsibilities. So uh, the initial days, they all, uh, you know, literally learned from each other. They, they made mistakes, they learned to figure it out, and slowly grew the company together. And everybody was taking individual responsibilities. So the first team, in fact, one very unique thing about Sujata's you know, style of management is that um, she treats employees, continues to treat them as part of her extended family. I think this comes naturally to a woman leader, but literally, part of our family, a part of the family, in the sense that, uh, you know, being part of their, all their happy moments, their marriages, their children, big life decisions, she's involved and continues to be involved in all of those. And perhaps as a result of that, I can happily share that uh, more than 50 employees, even now, continue to be with her after 30 years. And they're all running their own business units. It's unthinkable in this industry that, you know, have such a high vintage. And every one of them is a senior manager taking care of their own unit. So one incident that I would like to mention here that I'm going to tell you. So in 1998, um, so one of these days, she had, it's a new office. She had just gone to the pantry. And uh, as she saw, the, so next to the pantry, just visualize this, the pantry. Next to the pantry, there's a small turning, and there's a room there where the battery and the main LA, EB room, as you say, the UPS and all that is located. For some reason, she was propelled to go there and she saw through the glass door smoke building up inside that uh, room. And, uh, you know, quite shocked as she looked, you can see flames picking up. So the EB room is on fire. And imagine that shock, you know, your, your one crore office, suddenly, you know, it's just a new office and it's caught fire. And there's a lot of panic, instant panic. Everybody's young. Imagine all of us, if there's a fire here, how, you know, our age group. And she herself was just 32 years. So uh, there's a lot of pandemonium, panic. And uh, Sujata was distraught and in tears. She just went to a quiet corner of the office and took out from her handbag Swami's photo and uh, prayed to Swami, saying, Swami, I don't know. I, I need you to save me. Come now. Take charge. I don't know what to do. So the next moment, she says, she felt uh, you know, an electric charge run through her. Something, you know, it was a shock. And immediately she composed herself, tears dried up, and she took charge of the situation like, there's so many things to do. She immediately ordered an evacuation of the office, ensured that people are, uh, you know, safely removed. She called up the fire office, police station, um, and so many other things that had to be done, one after the other, as if she was fighting fires every day. And then it's an everyday thing that we do, you know, regular. So she did that. And by Swami's grace, all and none of the people were harmed in any way, though there was extensive damage to the office. That part of the office was completely gutted, nothing. So the fire engines came, put out the fire, they caused more havoc with, because of, you know, pouring water straight into the office. And uh, oh, a very important thing I'd like to say here, what happened was immediately the people, the team that I told you, youngsters, they spontaneously organized themselves. They salvaged all the equipment, whatever they could. Customer property, letters were, you know, very uh, important. So they, they removed the letters. And they went back to our old office at home and reset the office. They organized themselves into three shifts. All the men would work all night, women on two shifts. And within 24 hours, work had restarted without any impact for the client. 
It's a huge uh, thing and, and it's completely spontaneous. Nobody asked them to do it. What would we do? You know, you'd just say, ah, okay, office is on fire, I'll take a, <laughs> take a break. So this is very touching. Well, in fact, one thing I like to always remember is this is one employee whose marriage was on that day. He heard about the fire. His reception was in the evening. This happened in the evening. Reception was in the evening. He dropped his reception and came to, you know, help with the office. So we the great persuade. Imagine doing that. And so with, we had some, you know, they had to persuade him to go back to your reception and, you know, that it will be handled. So such touching instances. Next day, a fire inspector came. It's a big fire on Mount Road. So the chief of uh, fire safety, I mean, uh, I think the CFS person came. And he obviously took an inspection of the office. And um, so he came to this place where the fire had started, the UPS room that I was telling you. And he asked a very puzzling question. He said, Madam, who stopped this fire here? He said, what do you mean, who stopped the fire? What do you mean? So what he showed us, what he showed was there's a cable, the main cable going from the UPS room. That cable goes around, the feeder cable they call it, goes around the office. It's completely burnt inside that room. Just at the place where it exits the window, it stopped burning. Exactly, it actually looked like somebody had you know, held on to the fire. And he said, you know, this is very unusual. I've never seen something like this. A cable generally keeps burning and it doesn't stop burning. If it's a burn, now you have flame retardant and all that. All that is not there that time. The EB cable catches fire, it's, it's a big headache. And this cable goes around the building. So the whole building would have gone up in fire and you know, the damage would have been total. So he said, who stopped the fire? Of course, we knew who stopped the fire, right? The same person who gave her the courage to you know, take control of the situation Swami had come to her rescue. And you know, he's always there. We just need, need him, you know, he, we just have to call out to him and he immediately responds. So the story doesn't end there. Um, so we had, over the next few weeks, the office was being restored, things were coming back into place, but Sujata had some trouble with the insurance. So they were only giving 40% of the value, which was not enough to cover the loss. So she was a little disturbed. But to thank Swami for saving uh, the company from total disaster, she went with her family to Parthi to have darshan. As she enters the ashram, there's a floral arch. And the ashram, you know what you said, uh, what the arch said? Uh, it says the grace of God is like insurance. When you need it the most, it will be given to you. <laughs> so obviously we knew what Swami had done. And uh, in the end, she got back a very fair amount of the insurance claim. <clears throat> Another important aspect of entre entrepreneurship, sticking to your values. Now, a small story to illustrate this. So thanks to the excellent work that was being done, the clients started giving. Citibank gave more and more business. And they were booming. They were the first movers in the credit card industry. So their business was booming. And you know, therefore, as a result, ours as well. And paper mail slowly made way to electronic mail. That was the first time it got introduced. But electronic mail means we have to have direct connectivity to the bank. So in all, uh, you know, for practical purposes, we were like an extension of the bank. So they had direct connectivity. On our computers, we could see customer information, uh, respond to the customer on email, and so on. All common things now. Again, it's a very new concept at that time. But this also comes with some risks. What happened, unfortunately, was one employee got tempted and committed financial fraud. So he misused his privileges and made off with lakhs of, I think by the, the mechanism I can explain in detail, but basically he charged a card of a customer and started buying things. Luckily for us, the people at, the client had not detected this. And the, uh, the seniors at MMC itself, they, they detected this, and when they investigated, they were shocked to see the, the extent of the fraud, the amount. So everybody was panicking again. And uh, so there's a real moral dilemma at this point of time. You know, if you tell the client, go up front and tell him that such a thing has happened, you could have the entire business revoked. Naturally, it's a huge financial fraud. Maybe, you know, if you just keep quiet about it and nobody will notice, you can cover it up. Or, uh, so this is, a, this is what people were thinking. So Sujata did not hesitate uh, to make that decision. So she armed herself with all the facts of the case. She called up the bank, requested an urgent meeting with the head of credit cards, and went straight by herself to the bank's headquarters. 
There she met the head of credit cards, broke open the facts of the case, told them that a fraud has been committed at MMC, apologized, and she said, you know, whatever action that the bank deems fit to take is acceptable, and she left. So she was expecting the worst. I mean, she was ready for the worst. Mentally, she prepared herself. Next day, the head, gentleman, the head of credit cards, called her up. And uh, he said, you know, the, the entire bank appreciated her honesty, upfrontness, and coming up with the case and sharing on her own, for being forthcoming and sharing this case. And he said, no further action needs to be taken. Whatever amount that man had made off, we managed to recover it and paid it back. And that was it. So there was not, not a single you know, black mark on our record. And in fact, from then on, business only increased even more. So it's very important that honesty in business is a must. It takes great courage to stick to the truth, but you must. And the reward is always great. It's worth the effort. From, uh, this was 1998. So 1998 to 2003, MMC, which was four, became almost 400 plus. Um, the company was slowly getting recognized for its core values of integrity, reliability, and quality. So in 2003, I understand that most of you were just born in that year. So 2003, another big MNC bank, HSBC, approached us, because they had heard about this work that we do. And they came and said, uh, you know, would you like to be our partner? Would you like to also provide such similar services to us? And this is the first instance of uh, HSBC ever outsourcing, okay? So never, they, they're a very conservative bank, they're a British bank, and they never do any outsourcing. First time they have stepped up to outsource. And um, it's a huge opportunity, obviously a massive opportunity. So they invited us, and we couldn't say no. So we went and made a presentation in Mumbai. They were completely Mumbai-based. And uh, the other companies that had come were like big shots, Emphasis and TCS and uh, Mindtree and... I mean, you're talking about 20,000, 15,000 strong companies. And we were like 400. Amazingly, they selected us. They said, uh, you know, they were, so, I don't know, maybe the work that we're doing for Citibank helped. And um, so they selected us. But this one condition from this bank. So they, so HSBC at that time had a lot of union trouble. And so, you know, so it was very important for them to quickly transition this job from their location to our location. So they said, you have one month to do this entire transition. From the time of signing the contract, within one month you should start. So, uh, I mean, we are completely Chennai based, we have no contact in Mumbai, Mumbai whatsoever. And another uh, big restriction they put was, you should have exclusive premises for our operations. So we can't take up one more floor in the same building, no. You have to have separate premises as well. How many things to do? Um, you know, you have to find a completely new team. You have to identify premises. You have to um, send people this, you know, identified team. You send them to Bombay, get them trained, get it back, you know. And so many expenses around us, and uh, we just didn't have the financial strength to take that on at that time. It was a big struggle. And if this was not enough, my father had a heart attack. And he, in a very serious, again, a big story, but, you know, it was completely by Swami's grace, he was saved. So he underwent angioplasty. My younger brother, Siddhartha Raju, I think, you know, more famous than me, you'll know, most of you should know him. He was doing his 12th standard, uh, his, his board exams at the same time. And me, who was, I was supposed to be the face of this company, I got my MBA admission, uh, you know, in, in Parthi. So I'm leaving as well. All this is happening in just two months. Okay. So extreme, uh, extremely difficult time. And... Um, it was only my mother's immense faith in Swami uh, and uh, you know, his completely protective embrace that helped us get through this period. We did. And as promised, on June 1st, 2003, three business solutions, a new company we had formed, was started. So all, you know, all credit to him. <laughs> I was going to skip the <laughs> slide. Okay, let me narrate a small incident here. So, just to show, you know, Swami, how much he loves us. So, on 1st June 2003, the grand inauguration was to happen. And um, all the people from HSBC had come from Mumbai, and 
35,000 paper applications. So we were doing credit card application processing. That was the process we were doing. Credit card applications, basically you have an application form. There will be somebody who does the data entry and you know, the sub subsequent stages of processing till the credit card is issued to the customer. So paper forms had come, 35,000 of them. Officials, big ones, all uh, you know, senior officials from HSBC have come. They're watching. And the, uh, the plan was that we will do a data entry of the first application and you know, symbolic and everybody will clap. So my, the manager who was in charge, he was sitting down, he was going to do the data entry. Everybody's watching. My mother just casually walked across to that big bureau where 35,000 applications had come. She pulled out one and gave it to this person, Ramesh, and said, uh, Ramesh, start. But everybody's waiting to clap, and Ramesh is not doing the data entry. He said, Ramesh, what are you doing? Start. Ma'am, he said, what? Ma'am, see this. See the name. <laughs> And uh, she took the application. Would you believe what the name was? H. Sai Baba. Okay. So <laughs> you still get goosebumps just thinking about it. So what other way, what a nice way for Swami to show his presence at that moment to tell us that he's with us every second. And um, all the tension that she had, you know, accumulated during, before this uh, inauguration, just melted away the warmth of his, of his love. So... Try started, and uh, it was again very, very uh, you know period of incredible growth. HSBC had just entered into outsourcing, and they were you know selling credit cards left, right, and center. Uh, I think almost 10,000 applications a single day. And soon we ran out of space in this new building that we had. And people were literally sitting on each other's laps. So I finished my MBA in 2005, and I rejoined my mother's company, I, and I, uh, that's when I joined. And uh, there was no place at all. So if we completely stopped because the further growth was stopped because of lack of space. So again, we had to search for a new building. And uh, we contacted a broker who to show us all these locations. My mother and I went. I remember going place to place, many places we saw. Nothing really caught our, uh, you know, was suitable for what we wanted. One evening, we, I remember clearly, we came, it was around 6 p.m. And uh, he showed us one building. We entered it, and it's a magnificent building. It's, it's a, so beautiful. That's the one that I got in the photo. It's uh, by the seashore. And uh, we saw the floor. It's an entire huge hall, 5,000 square feet, completely empty, exactly the way we wanted, because then that allows us to build the workstations. And uh, my mother liked it so much that she did the same trick, I think. Pulled out this picture of Swami, kept it on a windowsill and just prayed. And Swami, you know, I hope this works out for us and hope we get this office. And uh, we came down. Just off the cuff remark, she asked this broker, uh, what, we're only giving it for rent, is it? They're not selling it. And the broker said, mm, we can find out, ma'am, not a problem. And immediately he called up somebody and uh, within minutes he said, it's available for sale as well. Uh, the cost of it is 12 crores. <laughs> and then Aristotle, we both laughed, we just broke out laughing and said, crazy, you know, building in 12 crores, how can, can you, can't even imagine buying something like that in such a premium location, we just left it at that. So she dropped me off at home and then she went to our old office in Mount Road, because she had some work to do. Around 7.30, she gets some uh, visitor, it's a man, a manager from Indian Bank. He walks in, typically what they do is they will go around canvassing for salary accounts or small uh, you know, services which they offer. And he came and uh, he asked my mother, uh, Madam, is there anything we can do for you? Do you need any business requirements? Uh, she just laughed and she said, yes, I have a requirement, but I don't think you will give you know, what we want. I said, no, you got to be a little offended. So he said, no, tell us, tell me, I, I, I can do it, Madam. He said, the uh, outlay is 12 crores. Can you think, you know, we can give it to us? He took her seriously and he said, we will do it. And unbelievably, within the, I think, over the next three weeks, 12 crores, a huge amount. Uh, I, I, I mean, I didn't know how many zeros were there in a crore at that time. 12 crore uh, loan was sanctioned between the two companies, MMC and Thrai. And we were standing on the terrace of this building. This, uh, what can you say? It's a good grace of Swami, you know. <laughs> I'm telling you, brothers. So I'm just telling you how... It's pointless to ask Swami for something. 
it's really useless what can you ask him you know he gives you things that you can't even imagine asking for and he himself says you know don't ask don't ask even your birth mother will only give you if you ask but swami will give you what you need without you asking for it and uh, so that you know you ask what he has come to give finally we asked that and literally the only thing that is worth asking because he gives us everything worth asking from him is love for him and that love that should keep growing there's nothing else worth asking from swami so with this building you know in our as an asset we just needed 5000 square feet we got 45000 square feet of space completely empty we didn't even have business for that but mmc and thrai uh, began to uh, uh, really get a good name in the industry it's a very small banking industry is a very very small industry somebody who's in one bank will go to the other bank i'm sure as if some of you will get into banks and you'll realize that um, such a very uh, tight knit industry <clears throat> so the good work or the bad work that you quickly spreads around and um, i think at this point i'll give you a little bit more detail about what it is that we do so that you know you understand so we are into business process acceleration it's jargon but what it means is we take clients processes and reengineer them so that the client gets the benefit of outsourcing typically we are into the domestic space we don't have any international clients and we are specialists in retail banking and credit card operations i'm sure you know what retail means retail means any custom any any uh, company that goes to the mass market not wholesale retail and uh, <clears throat> so our specialization is in credit card operations and banking operations and typically all banks have the same requirement in fact all cust- all companies that have uh, retail operations have just three requirements one how to get more customers second how to keep those customers happy three how do you generate more revenue from those customers so this is the customer life cycle so we provide services for all three aspects of you know this customer life cycle and that's been our core strength so uh, as we stabilized with city and hsbc had now this reach to stabilization we started reaching out for the first time to more opportunities and typically again though it's a, it's a uh, you know very tight knit community it's very tough to break through it's not a, a outsider can't just come into this industry and try to get in because the key uh, component is trust so it's because you're dealing with banking data direct access to customer uh, you know information and unless you have an impeccable record it is very difficult for an outsider to come in and say i'll start doing outsourcing because trust doesn't happen that easily but thankfully again somi's grace more and more customers started coming and um, i'm very happy to say and this is then they cut throat competitors to each other so you know in the sense they all target the same customers right so they they don't they don't like each other very much but unbelievably this is uh, you know all the all the banks that we've done work for so currently and in the past so it's a fairly exhaustive list of all private banks you know and private and telecom and and so almost all the big names we have british banks american banks you have uh, indian banks hdfc so it's quite a challenge to you know do this activity and keep them all happy and every building every every floor in our building is like a mini bank itself so each one is completely segregated only those uh, with access to that floor can go and it's like an extension of the bank so i think you know this this slide is just a testament uh, to the three values that we practice integrity reliability and quality otherwise it's not possible to assemble this zoo of uh, clients so just keep that in mind the values that we stick on uh, should be long lasting and something worth fighting for another uh, aspect that i would like to tell you and even when i joined in 2003 the first thing that i did was data entry so an entrepreneur should know all aspects of the business so it's not enough if you say you know i'll sit in your ac cabin and you know i'll just look at some i don't even know what i do these days but thing is you have to know all aspects you have to know the operations you have to know the finance you have to know hr who are you recruiting how are you recruiting are you recruiting the right people you have to do uh, the only thing that we don't do ma- is marketing because it, I, I, the, literally the work that we do our clients speak for themselves i speak and get business for us so we don't have a marketing department and i believe swami is our you know, head of marketing of course he's our md but he handles whatever marketing that we need to do but an entrepreneur should know all aspects of the business because that gives you the conviction to talk 
when you go to your client and suppose you want to renegotiate for a better rate, you should be able to tell him why you, know, you, need a, why you deserve a better rate. What have you done? It also gives you uh, a chance to understand what your employees are going through. So it's not fair to tell somebody to do this if you don't if you have the ability to do the same work. So it's, it's important to have that perspective. So onwards, and we all want to follow his path. What is his path? I mean, my path is to make Swami happy, simple. And I, uh, that's all we desire. We want to do things in life that will make Swami more happy. It's a simple desire. As students, we all share this. And if you want to make Swami happy, Seva is the easiest, right? Service. Most dearest to him. The simplest path that he has given us. And what better Seva is there than providing employment? Sustained employment opportunities. You don't just go and give something, but you give them a job so that they come back. They, you know, they, the whole family is uh, sustained by it. So with this thought in mind, this is the sole driving thought behind this company called Sai Seva, which was mentioned. I believe some of you have done internships there. I'm very, very proud. I'm very happy to know that. Um, so it's a rural BPO in Puttaparthi. The genesis for this, I'll just share. When I did my MBA in 2005, we have this book called Man Management. I'm sure you know it. You, okay, so. Amazing, it's a treasure. All the discourses given by Swami to the early MBA batches. By the time I was studying in 2003, I mean, it's all a distant dream. Uh, most of the uh, interviews had stopped by, I think, 1998 or so. Though rarely he would come and give. Uh, yeah, once a year, I think MBA day on August 25th, Swami still addressed my batch also. But earlier batches, almost every day, he would call them and give them amazing uh, insights into management. So in that, Swami says, that the soul of India is in the villages. And uh, if village culture is lost, then the nation itself is lost. And village culture is going away, isn't it? Why is that? If you think about it, one big reason is the migration of youth. So if the young uh, people leave villages and go to cities for greener or you know, greener pastures, then the village stagnates and the village dies. In fact, our own village in um, Trichy, near Trichy, it's like a ghost village. And only elders, 80 plus, there's no future growth for it. So this book, Man in Management, I had given my mother uh, to, to read when I was a student. And she was very inspired by this. And she started thinking, you know, what can we do to uh, do this? And she had this idea that maybe we could take this BPO. We don't know how to... Oh, wait, let me say, a very beautiful thing. Swami says, some of you come together and start a factory in the villages. I will give you whatever help you need. I'll even give you land, he says. You know? So this was the ins inspirational thought. And she said, we don't know how to run a factory. We're not in that business. So she said, what about BPO? Because we know BPO very well. And 15 years at that time of our company had been running. And even in our company in Chennai, right, all the people who come are from villages in South Tamil Nadu. They're migrating to cities. So we knew that this was an opportunity. What if we take the job to the village? So they don't have to migrate. And if they don't migrate from the village, they keep their parents happy. The income that they earn can be completely utilized. And the village keeps staying vibrant. So this was the idea. The concept was clear. So she wrote a letter. And uh, it was MBA day of 2005. She got an opportunity to give to Swami, and Swami accepted the letter. So the plan was on. Um, we even got two other co-founders. One of them is also an alumnus like me from the 93 batch. And we started this, we said we'll start a company, and we named it Sai Seva. Sai Seva is an acronym for Serve and Inspire Sustained Employment for Village Advancement. So the very grand name, uh, the founders are there. And we even discussed with our MBA group, uh, MBA teachers, who very nicely, they helped us crystallize the concept and all that. And we wanted to do it in a place, which village to choose? Puttaparthi. Puttaparthi is still a village. I mean, it's like a small town, not what it is today. Much, much smaller. So Puttaparthi would be the place that we will start. Everything is in place. But where is the business? So obviously, all these contacts, I showed you big names. We reached out to them and told them about this concept. But uh, none of them, at that point of time, they were not willing. It was too big a leap for them, some unknown village where, though Puttaparthi was well connected, they didn't take that leap for their loss. 
So we didn't have any breakthrough and we were quite distraught saying we're not able to make that one thing. That's all we need. I told you about my marketing director, right? So he sends somebody. He's an alumnus of our university. In fact, you'll be hearing him speak tomorrow, Sai Gunaranjan. So Sai Gunaranjan is, uh, was working in a company called Basics at that time. Basics was into microfinance. And microfinance is basically lending to the vill to, in small villages. So their work itself was around <coughs> village, uh, you know, uh, village folk. So they were willing to give this a try. So we identified a building, in, it's in Gokulam. Uh, it was then an uh, apartment complex, uh, two apartments in the first floor. Bottom is a cement go-down. And on the first floor, we took up space. Not too far from, uh, you know, not too close to it. Not too far. Shouldn't be too close to Puttapati as well. Should be a little away. But internet connectivity should be there. Power should be there. These are all essentials for a BPO. So perfect place. We went as far as Enminapalli and uh, even Bukapatnam, Kocharu. But that didn't work out. So Puttapati itself, we found a nice place. And we started. We had a, uh, one of the alumnus from our university was identified as a manager. We hired four people and work started. It was May 5th, uh, 2006 that Sai Seva came to be. And believe me, the work was so good, the work done was so good that the, the client basics, they also uh, were an expansion spree, I think, wherever we go, <laughs> this seems to be a recurring story. And uh, four became 14 within the first year. This was a very good success. And, and, and let me tell you, tell you this, both at MMC, Thrai and Sai Seva, the core value of our, uh, of our you know, thinking is to delight the customer and do the work in such a way that the customer speaks for you. And the customer brings more work. So uh, this is the, actually the only mantra for our, for our growth. So we had 14 people at uh, Sai Seva. And uh, again, Swami works something out for us. Mm, there was an MTech conference in 2007. MTech, and I'm, we have MBA, we have nothing to do with MTech. But just for that, I had gone, they had called me to make a presentation on Sai Seva and in our university, and I made a presentation. One of the delegates there was, uh, actually he's a person you met yesterday, Mr. C. N. Ram. So he was in HDFC Bank, he was the Chief Information Officer. So he saw this presentation, got very interested, he reached out and said, I'd like to come and see the office. I said, oh, most welcome, sir, and took him whatever it is worth, you know. And uh, he saw it, he was so happy that he arranged for his uh, colleague, the chief operating officer, Mr. Rajan, to come and visit Sai Seva. So Rajan came, he was extremely happy with what he saw and the fact that we had a pedigree in working for banks. So it's not, not like freshers, we have been in the business for 15 years, we're doing it in Chennai. So they came, they saw our Chennai office also. So they were convinced that we could do this work. And they fast-tracked things inside the office on 15th August 2007, brothers. Sai Seva started doing work for HTFC Bank. And uh, with 35 people, with uh, 35 people in the first floor of that building that I told you. So that is the cement go-down, you can see that's how Sai Seva looked. Uh, there's a snapshot from the early days, 2006-2007. And... Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, I mean, after the inauguration, the first year we had 35 people. And you know what HDFC Bank did? They had a big BPO in Bombay. They had, uh, I forget the name of it. And they benchmarked our quality with this city-based BPO's quality. If we compare, you can say. They found Sai Seva doing a far better job than a Mumbai BPO. They closed that BPO and moved all those jobs to Sai Seva. So 35 became 75 within just one year. So again, familiar story, we ran out of space and uh, by Swami's grace, we were able to buy that building that you see and we built four floors, so the ground plus three. So that's the Sai Seva building as it stands today. And all four floors are occupied, we have about 180 people now and six alumni as managers, all my juniors from six subsequent batches. And we've been doing this now for almost, we started in 2006, almost going to be 20 years now. So it's been a very great success story. We've, from HDFC Bank, we've also been doing work for other banks uh, off and on and some international clients as well. So this is in brief, you know, the story of uh, Sai Seva. Um, in, in 2009, we wanted to apply for this ISO certification. I'm sure you've all heard ISO this stands for International Standards Organization. ISO 9001 is a quality standard. 
And Swami talks so passionately about quality in man management. You should see, you know, he says quality, uh, and, and the quality should be part of everything that we do. Everything, our thought, word, and deed should be inspired. And we wanted to get this certification and offer it to him. So we worked very hard, and uh, on one fine day, the auditors came, they, they did the audit, and they found us fit to get the ISO certification. So they'll give you something called a specimen certificate. It's not the real certificate, it's a copy. It'll say specimen certificate, but they issued that, and they went. And same day, my mother took it, rushed to Darshan, took it, um, and, and waited. Swami came, and she got up, and she said, Swami, your Sai Seva has got ISO certification. And you know what Swami did so beautiful? He smiled and uh, he took that certificate <laughs> from her and took it back with him. So just a very sweet memory that I thought I'd share. So that's, that's my mother sharing the certificate. <clears throat> so the impact of Sai Seva is, is not just limited to Puttaparthi. Inspired by Sai Seva, so many rural BPOs have started across the country over the last, so many people have reached out to me over the 20 years, you know, and we freely share whatever knowledge, what does it matter? We share whatever we know and help them uh, in whatever way we can. And many of them are flourishing even today. Um, in fact, even my mother, she started, she, from, uh, inspired by Sai Seva, they started another company called Rural Shores. And Mr. C. N. Ran, my mother, and two others, they started a company called Rural Shores, which the aim at that point of Rural Shores was to take rural BPO in a large way, because Sai Seva was limited by, uh, we've always wanted Sai Seva to be a model center, and inspiring others. And so they uh, started a company called Rural Shores, and uh, this Rural Shores won uh, in the Edison Award for Social Innovation in New York in 2012. It's a big award, so it's an innovation award, so they recognized this concept and uh, awarded it in a big way. <clears throat> so as Sai Seva completed 10 years, we felt it was time to do something else and a new venture. So in 2017, my, my daughter, she was just three years old, and she was going to a school, a Montessori school in Chennai. Seeing her, uh, do you know what Montessori education is? You may have heard of this word Montessori. Montessori education is not a classroom kind of thing. It, it caters to children in a very different way. It's education where children are exposed to a lot of learning tools, a lot of toys, uh, things that look like toys, which they can pick up. And they experience and they learn on their own. They learn concepts like language, math, and uh, you know, uh, culture, and social interactions in a very, very different way, which, and in fact, they learn from each other. One child does it, the next child sees it. So the class teacher is just a moderator and helps them with giving them the right things. And all. So amazing concept. Uh, a lady called Maria Montessori pioneered it. And my daughter was going to a Montessori school. So seeing the progress that my daughter was making and amazing change in her, so my mother had this idea that Puttaparthi should also have a Montessori school. Why? Because, again, many of our staff are married and have young children. Doctors are there, and they have kids. And though we have an amazing uh, education system from first standard onwards, there's nothing good or nothing great uh, from ages three to five. That is a big gap that is there and was there in Puttaparthi. And uh, she realized this, and she thought we should start a Montessori school to cater to that. Because three to five is the age where children are most... Uh, uh, I mean, should we be all that age? But the amount we grasp at that age is fantastic. And it has a very lasting impact. So <clears throat> we, again, needed a good place. We uh, searched high and low for a place with enough uh, greenery and space and all that. And didn't have any luck. One day, our well-wisher and um, you know, he's also a builder in Puttaparthi, he called up my mother and said, Madam, there's a place that I've seen. I think it'll be perfect for you, uh, very suitable for you, and um, please come to Parthi as soon as you can. So we went, and this is the place he showed us. So it's, it's, it's on Westgate Road. You know, the, there's a back gate entrance to Parthi. So it's on Westgate Road. It's an independent compound, almost half an acre in size, full-grown trees, and a in, you know, small bungalow right in the middle of it. It's been unoccupied for 10 years, just waiting for us. 
So, you know, how, uh, in fact, you knew how much we struggled to locate such a place, you'll understand the joy that we felt when we saw that. Again, by Swami's grace entirely, we were able to uh, buy that property, and we started this uh, Montessori school, school called Sai Sanatana, House of Joyful Learning. Now, I mean, I've bored you enough with just talking, so I have a small video, uh, which was a video we made, uh, you know, as a campaign video for Sanatana. I hope it plays, let's see. You have to click something? Uh. Welcome to Sai Sanatana, the house of joyful learning, a Montessori preschool located in a very spacious and serene environment in Puttaparthi. The Montessori method of learning is a revolutionary educational practice which helps children develop creativity, problem solving, social and time management skills. At Sai Sanatana, our children have the opportunity to learn all the subjects they would learn in any other school, including math, language and culture. The Montessori method of learning makes our children self-reliant and confident through observation and self-learning. the unique way in which our children learn the concepts of language and math. Our children also learn art, yoga, handwork and painting. Physical activity is an integral part of the child's time at school. Our spacious and well-equipped play area is every child's delight. Admissions are open for the next academic year. For applications and more details, please contact us at 9141714475. So, uh, We started with five children, and today we have 75. <laughs> so again, it's just not a numbers game. I'm just saying, you know, when the concept is, is right, and all the circumstances around it are perfect, an idea is bound to succeed. Um, <clears throat> I'll bring my talk to a close now. I, I still have some time. Maybe we can have some questions. And I just want to close up, uh, close with these thoughts. As Swami's students, we all have the natural urge to do good, right? We want to do good. That's natural. We are his students. By cultivating socially responsible thinking. What do I mean by that? By looking out or being responsive to society's needs, wherever we may be, as we go in through life, whichever society we are in, being responsive and responsible for that society will trigger you to find opportunities and where gaps lie. And, and where the gaps are, the opportunities, the business opportunities naturally lie. So if the business idea is rooted in the intent to do good, rather than the intent to make some money, it will be sustainable and profitable. And Sai Sanatana and Sai Seva are two examples of uh, successful ventures that have followed this thought process. Now, I hope through this very real story, you were able to pick up some essential traits of what it is to be an entrepreneur. And uh, you know, for the benefit of the student who will be summarizing and giving me the vote of thanks, uh, I'll tell you, you need first a strong intent, a reason to be in the business that you are in. <laughs> okay. Now, don't worry, I'll summarize for you. So, so you need to have a good intent. And why, why are you in entrepreneurship? Why, why do you want to be in it? Next, the ability to identify opportunities. You should have be able to see. And this is the reason I told you to be aware of social requirements itself leads to good business opportunities. Third, you need to have self-confidence and absolute faith in your concept that it will work. Vital are, is customer service, customer orientation. It's very, very important because that will drive all your thought processes around 
uh, building your company. You should also have the ability to identify the right talent. As Sir was speaking about leadership. And as I heard him, every, uh, you know, uh, uh, everything that he said, I could resonate with, I see it in my mother. So the ability to identify the right talent is so critical because um, they are the people who will build your company. You can't be omnipresent and like Swami, but you know, they are the people who run the business. And if today if I'm here I, without a care, because I know there's somebody running the show back at home. So it's very important to identify the right talent. Your willingness to take risk. Entrepreneurship is inherently risky, but it's worth taking the risk if you, con you know, consider it carefully. I showed you a number of examples where the leap was so large, you didn't think that you could do it. But with that faith in him, you know, it's possible to always bridge the gap. <clears throat> Finally, adherence to fundamental values. So you cannot, no matter what the temptation is, and Swami himself has said, in business, while earning artha, you will have temptation to take shortcuts. If you resist that temptation, if you stick true to your values, success is guaranteed. And, and, and you know, an ingredient that I don't have to mention, selfless effort. Without effort, nothing comes. So you have to work, be really, you know, ready to work really, really hard. I know how hard Mr. Ramesh works. I, I don't know if he spoke about his company as well, but he runs a very successful firm. And the amount of hard work, and I see this, even today, I see every, everybody I see who runs their own company, they put in hours of work, and it is worth uh, the effort. <coughs> all this is useless without his grace, because it all has to come together in one person. And grace, I can assure you, brothers, with confidence, all of us have his grace, equally. There's not that I'm special, or he's special, or you're special. His grace reigns upon us equally, and he has himself said it. All we need to do is to be able to receive it and have a vessel big enough to gain, to get his grace. General advice, un un asked for, but I, I, as younger brothers, I wish to share. Offer your 100% to Swami. Whatever you do in life, make it an offering. As students, you're doing it. Every, I offer it to Swami, I offer it to Swami. Don't we? Every program we say we offer it to Swami. Make that a habit. Offer whatever you do in life, uh, make it an offering to him. And whatever outcome comes, cheerfully accept it as a prasadam. May not be everything that you do will be a success. So many stories I haven't told you. you know, I just had told you the pleasant things, so many challenges, so many losses. Uh, didn't have time for all that. But accept everything with that sense of equanimity. It's his prasadam after all. And he knows what is best for us. Another uh, you know, advice that I share is maintain you know, a ceiling on material desires. They say a COD, ceiling on desires. It's very important. So it's, once we start earning, once you get into your first jobs, start saving. You know, cut down what we don't need. It really doesn't, you know, it's not important that we have the flashiest iPhone. It's not important that you have, uh, you know, whatever society outside, as you will see, things differently. Maintain what we have learned here. It will go a long way. Maintain, it's important to have essential things, but don't go overboard. So maintain a ceiling on desires, it's, it, goes, it goes a long way. And finally, remember, don't compare yourself with somebody else. Okay? Everybody has their own unique path. Okay, Swami has already charted it out to you, for you. So don't compare and say, I'm here after so many years and he's there. So it just doesn't work. As you step into life, you will find that you cannot be grateful enough to Swami for all that he will shower upon you. And I'm assuring you of this. All you need to do is to ensure that you remain worthy of being called a Sai student. I wish you all the best. Thank you. And Sai Ram. I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Sure, please. Brother, I'm brother, I'm not sir. <laughs> A very technical question, but yeah, uh, one thing is, as he said, quality is essential. Quality can be assured um, uh, through good training. You have to invest in training because uh, uh, training is absolutely essential. One thing that we do uh, is a, it's a very intuitive thing. So if the process is complex, 
We don't give it all to one person and say, here, you do it. We break it up into smaller pieces. It's called you know, a salami technique. So everybody does a small part of it. Like, you know, all of you together will do the activity, but everybody does a small thing. So it's a repetitive task, but it's also likely that there are less errors if you do that way. That is one thing. Training is most essential. And uh, we also have a lot of quality uh, tools that detect errors, that catch errors before they happen. Uh, quality audit is very essential. So it's, it's a very generic thing that I can't really pinpoint and say we do this because we do different things for different processes. Uh, sis good systems are essential. Suppose your, you know, your system allows you to do what you want. You, know, you can capture title as Mr. and gender as female. You know, that's a systemic error. So you can build safeguards that don't allow those things. For information security, it's a good question. We also are ISO 27001 certified. It's uh, 9001 is for quality, 27001 is an even more higher standard for information security. So information security is, is like at the top of the mind, right? Because you, know, you can't have data leakages, though you see it all the time happening on the net. Um, so we ensure watertight compartments for each client. So I told you, physically also you can't go, maybe five people in my company can go between all floors. Otherwise, employees are restricted to that, that to each floor. We don't allow cell phones. You have to deposit cell phones outside. You can't go and click a photo of a credit card, take it home, and you know, and, and, and swipe on somebody else's number. So you can't do that. Paperless completely. There is some amount of frisking, you know, which is required. <clears throat> Those are people controls. Then there are other physical controls, like you know, you have access control doors. I mentioned CCTV cameras. Uh, networks are physically segregated. So the network on which the work of the client is done has no internet. So you can't really access anything else but the network of the client. Many techniques, and I don't want to really go into uh, too much of that, but it is very essential. It is drilled into every employee, and every employee has to undergo an information security training, mandatory, and pass that before we even give him access to a computer. Okay? Hope that answers your question. That's all. That's it. Yeah, I'll, uh, thank you so much, Sairam. Thank you, sir, for your valuable inputs. It was very wonderful to hear the inspiring story of your mother and how Thrive Business was started. You explained to us about how self-confidence is an important virtue for an entrepreneur, how values are important in business. You also gave us the characteristics of an entrepreneur that is strong intent, identifying opportunities, self-confidence, customer orientation, identifying right talent, willingness to take risk, adherence of human values and ethics, and selfless effort. You also told us about how Honesty in business, as in life, is must. And also to have faith in our divine master. Again, thank you very much, sir. We would love to hear more about you and from you in future. Now, I'd like to call upon Professor S.I. Manoa, Associate Professor, to give away the token of love to Sir Prashant Aja. Now we'll all wait to take batch-wise group photo and then 